So hi everyone, my name's Renee Madsen. I'm going to be facilitating today. Uh, just a, a couple of things to make you aware of before we get started. We are recording the event today and um, in the unlikely event of an emergency, they've asked us just to go out the back door and assemble in the car park out the back here. Okay, so let's go back to our agenda. So, so the purpose of today, um, for the folks who haven't been to a forum like this before, the purpose of today is really for um, all of us to understand a bit more about Paddington to Reef. So, um, thinking about some of the latest developments, understanding you know some of the um, the latest outcomes that we're getting, and um, get a bit of a progress update. And uh, we're very keen um, today for the presentations to uh, really get people thinking and asking questions. So. Uh, with the question time today, we're going to do a little bit differently to what you may have seen. So we're actually going to use our phones um, to provide some questions and feedback after each speaker. So if you have your phone with you, please uh, feel free to grab it out. If you didn't bring your phone with you today, that's okay. We've got a couple of um, feedback forms on the table that you can use instead of the phone. Uh, but how we'll run it today is after every speaker, there'll be about 10 minutes, and I'll actually put a question up here on the screen that will just ask you if you have any comments or feedback. You'll be able to use your phone to type in your comments or questions, and they'll come up here. Uh, and for the folks who are using the feedback forms, we'll make sure we collect those at the end so we get your, your questions as well. So the speakers will have about 10 minutes after their presentation to answer some of the questions that come up here. Uh, they may not get to all of them, but that's okay. Um, they've very kindly undertaken to take a copy away of all the questions that get asked today. They'll write some brief answers and send those to Reef Catch until they send them around to you after the after the session today. So thanks to the speakers for doing that. So that's kind of how the question time will work. So basically just a, a very quick overview of the agenda for today. So uh, firstly, we're actually going to use that, that phone feedback system just to hear from you at the start of the day about what you'd like to get out of the day, um, you know, what background we're about to from. It's always nice to know who's in the room. Uh, and then we'll hand over to Carl. So Carl is from the Department of Environment and Science. He'll give us a bit of an overview of Paddock to Reef in general and also the latest report card that's come out. And then we'll hand over to Body from um, Healthy Rivers to Reef. And Body will talk about the regional report card. And then, we will have Adam. So Adam's from Department of Agriculture and Fisheries and he's going to talk to us about the um, survey questions and how they've changed over time. Uh, have a bit of a chat about the projector tool. We'll have a break for lunch and that'll be served here just around the corner. And uh, we'll hear from Ram after lunch. So Ram's from Department of Natural Resources and Mines. He'll have a talk to us about the modelling part of the program. We'll hand over to Jane from uh, C2A Consulting, and Jane will talk to us about the marine monitoring stuff, so the coral and the seagrass results, how all that's going. And lastly, but definitely not least, we're going to hear about some local projects around. So we've got Adam from Pharmacist and Emily from Reef Catchments, who are going to give us an overview of Sandy Creek, and then we'll hear from Steve, who's going to talk to us about uh, Jane's Creek. And then we'll have a, a very short wrap up at the end of the day. Um, the venue has let me know that they do have another event after us, so uh, we will have a fairly quick wrap up, but that will be a, a great opportunity um, for you guys to provide some feedback on how you found today, uh, if you actually got what you wanted out of it, if you've got some suggestions for next time, and uh, yeah, we'll just clarify what the next steps are from here, and then we can all go along our merry way. Okay. All right, so I might move us over now to um, the uh, feedback system. So this is the, what we're using with our phones. So please grab your phone. Uh, if you don't have your phone with you, just grab one of these um, feedback forms that are on the table. But uh, go to like the website, so www.menti.com. So for the folks who are using Apple, it'll be Safari. For the folks using Google, it'll be Edge, uh, Chrome, if you like. And then there's a code at the top of the screen. And once you get there, there should be a thumbs up. So you can feel free to hit the thumbs up, let us know that you've, you've made it. There we go. You can see a few down the bottom now. I like to think this is a thumbs up for me. How many people think I'm a good facilitator? Yes, 10, 11 people, fantastic.
I'm going to move to the next slide. That's okay if you're still getting set up. Don't worry. You can catch up anytime. So whereabouts are you from? Which one best describes your role? So NRM project officer, looks like the, the biggest gathering here, that's great. Oh, it's nice to see we've got someone in every category at least, so that, that's wonderful. Very good. It's always nice to get a um, big range of people here, that's how we get the most, um, most questions and the most input. All right, and is this the first time you've been to this kind of thing before? because it's always nice for our, our speakers to know um, who's here and um, always good for, for us to have an idea of um, how many people have been here before. Okay, and what would you like to get out of today? Okay, so knowledge and understanding is coming up. It's quite a common thing. Absolutely. So you come to the right place. Fantastic. Information on the projector. Absolutely. We'll cover that, which is wonderful. P2R methods and usage. Current and water quality. Well, that's great. We've got some presentations from, um, from uh, speakers about the uh, local report card. Understanding how P2R works in assessing farm practice. Absolutely. We will cover that. Local info. Networking, good food, um, good. Yeah, it's very important. No. Updating the programs, updating the report cards, absolutely. Future direction, yes, that would be great. If we can come um, from today with some understanding of where we're going from here, yeah, that would be wonderful. Models to reflect actual long ground advancements, yes. Networking with like-minded people on black. We've got 40 minutes for lunch, so that's great. That's a really good opportunity for everyone to have a, a chat. Okay. Excellent. That's wonderful feedback. Thank you, everyone. What we can do is actually send a copy of this around um, after the event um, for you all, just to have a record. Okay. All right. So, sorry about that. That's for our next presentation. All right, so Carl, I would like to hand over to you if you're um, ready uh, for your presentation.
Good morning, everyone. My name is um, Carl Mitchell. I'm from the, the Office of the Great Barrier Reef, and I'm, I live in town, Toowoomba, but I'm a, a Mackay boy. Um, I was telling Renee earlier that I used to do Woodwatch sampling with kids down in uh, the goose ponds here, and I was telling Sarge it was 20 years ago, um, so that's a bit of a, a shock to me how long ago that was. But I know a few of you in the room, um, and I'm here for the the whole day. So if you want to come and talk to me, um, that's what I'm here for, um, to try and give you an overview of what we do as far as monitoring and modelling for the Great Barrier Reef. <coughs> Get our technology working here. So I'm involved in a program called the Paddock Reef Integrated Monitoring, Modelling and Reporting Program. We produce a report card on the status of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and all of that is embedded in um, a range of government policies and plans. And I'm just going to give you a bit of an overview of what that is and then talk about the different components of our program. And then I've got some people here today who are going to give the detail on what those uh, different elements of monitoring and modelling are. But why do we have monitoring and reporting for the Great Barrier Reef? Because the reef is pretty high profile uh, internationally and we have it uh, as a World Heritage Area uh, and both the Australian and Queensland governments have made a commitment um, through the World Heritage um, Committee to maintain the values of the Great Barrier Reef and that's across a whole range of components um, through climate change, land based runoff, coastal land use, uh, coastal change and direct use and we have Carolyn from the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority here today and Carrot and, and Gabrumpa are basically across this whole area looking at all of these different components that impact the Great Barrier Reef and how do we manage those better. Uh, and as I said, both um, Australian and Queensland government have made a commitment to um, maintaining those values of the Great Barrier Reef and that is done through something called the Long Term Sustainability Plan which looks at all of these elements and how we're going to try and manage that. But my component, the Paddock Reef Program um, and the Reef Report Card, is really only focused in on this one component, um, and that is the water quality elements and the land-based runoff. And that's because there's a, main, a couple of things that uh, put pressure on the reef from that land-based runoff point of view, and they are nutrients, and namely dissolved organic nitrogen, which is a form of nutrient that's readily available in the marine environment, um, and it can lead to things like uh, algal blooms and transitions from reefs from coral reefs to algal reefs. A fine sediments, they can punch out into that inshore marine environment and when we're talking about impact from land-based um, pollution, we're talking about that coastal <coughs> area of the Great Barrier Reef. We're not talking about the hard reef um, way offshore, we're talking about those coastal elements. Uh, so fine sediments reduce your life availability to a lot of those inshore environments, particularly seagrass and coral. And we're talking about pesticides. Uh, and they um, mostly are impacting the streams and those estuarine and, and really close shore areas. So we're going to have a bit of a look at those today, but they're the three components that my program is looking at. As I said, we have this overarching plan that looks at all of the things that are putting pressure on the Great Barrier Reef um, for the long term sustainability plan, the Reef 2050 plan for short. And it's one in a series of plans that have been developed by the Australian and Queensland government. And it looks at everything. It looks at agriculture, industry, urban, public lands, and all of the things that have potential to impact the reef. And again, the well, area that my program focuses in on is the water quality and ecosystem health, those land-based runoff elements. Um, we've got, in the latest version of the plan, which is currently being updated at the moment, we've looked at sort of the human dimensions and what the interaction with people and the environment has on those coastal areas of the Great Barrier Reef, including some of the social, cultural and economic values. Um, and we've set, we've gone from having one set of targets for improving water quality of the whole Great Barrier Reef to 35 individual catchment targets. So we're getting better at um, identifying what sort of changes are required where to take the pressure off those inshore environments. Sitting underneath that high level 2050 plan that looks at everything, um, we have this Reef 2050 Water Quality Improvement Plan um, and it sets um, this long term 2050 outcome that good water quality would sustain the outstanding universal value of the Great Barrier Reef, build resilience 
and improve ecosystem health and benefits for communities. And underneath that, we have going from individual actions, working with people through to a range of catchment and land management targets, water quality targets and objectives for um, improving ecosystems in the state that we would like to see ecosystems in. So there's a whole range of human dimension targets that we're developing about how do we engage with people to um, the state of the, of the land and agriculture. And we've got a current target of 90% of land in priority areas under grazing, horticulture, banana, sugarcane, and other broadacre crops are managed using best management practices for water quality. Um, this target is currently under review, and we've just gone out to tender for an independent review of that target. As I mentioned before, we used to have one target for water quality for the whole reef, and now we've got down to 35 individual catchment targets. We're hoping to get some specificity in this um, land management target as well, so that we can it can be much better fit to where the priority areas and priority actions for improving land management, and that's part of an independent review that is out that's just closed for tender. So we're we're going to be working with some consultants on how do we develop that, and then taking that out to a lot of the ag industries and others um, to try and set some better, some more uh, finer scale land management targets. We have our water quality targets around the improvements in water quality that we, that we need to see at the end of the catchment in order to support the seagrass and coral um, and aquatic ecosystems at the end of the catchment, and then we have the objectives. So in those water quality targets is where my reporting focus is in on. And for the Macaulay Sunday region, um, we have this target for 70% improvement in anthropogenic things, so we're only looking at those sources of dissolved and organic nitrogen um, from human impacts. We're not looking at the natural and the base loads. Um, we're only looking at those uh, anthropogenic loads and uh, we're looking at 20% reduction in fine sediment for this part of the world. And the way that we set those targets is we've got a, a range of tools that we use, but one of the main ones has been we've got a, a marine ecosystem model that we've looked at what the water quality requirements at the, in the seagrass beds and those coastal environments are, and then we've taken those thresholds for water quality and looked back up the catchment and said what sort of reduction in current loads would be required to maintain those seagrass beds at that concentration of water quality that we would require, and these are the numbers that we've come up with through that process and then we've cross-checked that with our monitoring and, and other um, historical coral data and a whole range of other things that Jane might give a broad overview of some of those monitoring in the marine environment that are fed into that. Um, so these are our, our local targets for water quality. These um, are on a five year review cycle and they will be up for review in 2022 and we're actually currently looking at that process now. So that gets me to the Pay for the Reef Integrated Monitoring Modeling Reporting Program. And the role of the program is to report on how well the two governments are going towards achieving all of those targets in the Reef 2050 Water Quality Improvement Plan. And to do that, we have a range of monitoring and modelling that we put into this um, Reef Report Card. So we report progress towards our 2050 Water Quality Improvement Plan. It's a large program. We've got um, partnerships with both governments, um, government departments, uh, universities, and a range of um, local uh, stakeholders as well, uh, all providing data that tries to paint this picture that goes into our report card of how well um, we are going towards achieving those water quality targets of the 70 and 20% reduction um, in nitrogen and sediments in the Macaulay Sunday region. Um, the way we do that is through integrating monitoring and modelling. So we have a range of tools from uh, taking a water quality sample at the end of the catchment to um, doing surveys of landholders to understand what practices they, they're undertaking, to uh, doing paddock trials of what sort of <coughs> practices impact water quality and how much, to uh, and range of models that are then fill in the gaps between those various monitoring programs, and that's what I'll, I'll get into next. So this is sort of the outline of the paddock to reef program. It's not just a water quality monitoring and reporting program. We have everything from monitoring at the paddock scale, the capital scale, right through to the marine scale, and we'll have some presentations on that today. Um, 
Up in the back end, we have a stewardship program, which is looking at what sort of things are going on in the landscape but have the potential to impact water quality. And we have a management practice adoption program. Is Adam not here yet? Oh, there he is. <laughs> and Adam Falkers is involved in that, and Adam's going to present to us how they... What's that? <laughs> Sorry, I used to work about it, Falkers. Uh, Adam Nord is going to present on that. Um, and um, I'm throwing myself. So Adam's program is having a look at what sort of activities are going on in the landscape from an agricultural point of view. And then we have um, a paddock monitoring program that looks at what those activities mean to water quality. And we've got Ken Rohde up the back who's involved in that program. And then basically getting a signature for different practices through a range of um, uh, paddock trials, rainfall simulation, a whole range of activities to give us a feel for this practice, this type of managing the landscape has this impact um, on water quality. And then we have a range of paddock modelling. We haven't got any paddock modellers here today, but the paddock modellers take that data from Adam's program and from Ken's program and turn it into a suite of scenarios saying if you are undertaking this practice <coughs> in this part of the landscape, this is a water quality signature you would expect. And then we scale that up into the catchments. Those paddock models feed the catchment models and they take any changes in the landscape through government investment that Adam provides them is turned into a, um, a catchment, is uh, into a model load out of the catchment. And we also have a range of catchment monitoring all the way from Bundaberg to Cooktown that tell us what the water quality is actually coming out of those, into those catchments and we use that monitoring to train our models. So we, we integrate monitoring and modelling and the reason we do that is because the monitoring doesn't actually tell us the full story of what's going in the landscape, it doesn't enable us to take out the climate impact, it doesn't enable us to tease out that anthropogenic, the human based impact which is the only thing that we're interested in. So we have to use the models so that we can actually interpret what's happening in the monitoring and we can actually understand what changes in the landscape, what impact that will have on water quality. We do a range of catchment monitoring uh, with remote sensing and with the wetlands teams to get a feel for what's happening in the broader landscape. It's not just enough to know what's changed in agriculture, we also need to know what's happening in ground cover, riparian, wetlands, all of those sorts of things. And then we have a range of uh, marine monitoring which tells us the condition that's happening in the marine environment. So by pulling all of this information together um, into our report cards, we can get a feel for what contribution, what sort of progress we're seeing towards those um, water quality targets and those targets in the water quality improvement plan. So as I said, we produce this reef water quality report card. Um, I'm hesitant to say that it's an annual report card because it's one to two years, uh, depending on a whole heap of processes. Uh, the, latest, the latest report card is 2018-19. There's generally a 12-month delay in the, that financial year that we're reporting and the release of the report card. And that's because it takes us 12 months basically to quality assure all that data, to run the models, to pull the report cards together. It's quite a massive effort to get all that information and try and um, understand what it's saying. And then we also have a range of regional report cards, including the Macaulay Sunday Regional Report Card, and we have the Macaulay Sunday team here today with Bonnie and Talon and Emma? No. Ellie. So, uh, um, here today, I think Bonnie's going to talk about what's happening in the Regional Report Cards later on this morning. So, Ken's here today. So if you want to grab Ken's ear of how we do that paddock scale monitoring and understand what the individual water signature from specific agricultural practices are, go and bend Ken's ear in the break. But basically we do a, a, a range of trials um, to try and understand what's happening as far as water quality from individual practices. That's my 15 minutes. Um, we don't have any paddock modelers here today. Yeah, <laughs> 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 
Did I have any paddock modelers here today? That was 15, so I think I've got 30 on the agenda, so I'm doing sweet. Um, but as I said, the paddock modelers are taking the management data from Adam's program and the um, um, paddock monitoring data from Ken's program, um, putting them through a range of, of models and in the in the cane areas, if the modeler uses Absin, which is a CSIRO developed cropping model, um, to come up with water quality attributes on different soil types and different practices for different regions um, at the paddock scale that can then feed into our catchment models. And there's a complex diagram. And the other part of the program that's not here today is our monitoring. And we have a really extensive monitoring program. Um, There'll be some numbers, here we go. Uh, we've got 65 sites, as I said, from Burnett Mary region to the Cape York region, at, and that's 57 for nutrients and sediments and 31 for pesticides. Um, I think we're, yeah, we're covering about 92% of the sediment load from catchment to the Great Barrier Reef is captured in our monitoring program, and 88% of the nutrient load put in um, of the discharge is captured in our monitoring program. So we've uh, had a real big increase in the, the size and the capacity of our monitoring program over the last couple of years because we're really trying to get a feel more spatially for what's going on. And also there's a real push to do uh, finer scale monitoring. So I think in the next few years, we'll be looking at um, finer scale monitoring. We, with our monitoring, we're pushing more and more and more towards open data so that anyone can grab our data and have a look at what our monitoring data is um, saying. At the moment, that's a very static system, and if you scan this, um, what are these things called? QR code. QR code. Just scan this QR code, just pull up the phone app, other photo app on your phone, and scan that QR code. That will take you through to our story maps, which gives you the latest information from all of our monitoring program. Uh, and in the next couple of years, we will actually be doing, trying to release the data at an even finer scale and, and trying to have some live reporting of that data. But for the pesticide story, um, we actually have a pesticide monitoring portal up and running now where we, we can get our pesticide data, the latest information um, from pesticides across the state from our monitoring program. So, is this machine hooked up to the internet? Yes, it is. I'll just give you a very quick run through of. I think you have to press um, control. You know you have to do that control. Oh, yeah. So you might not have enough hands to get too much. <laughs> yeah. so, oh, there you go. Is that what you're after? It is, I just walked up there. Oh. that we developed, and this is a 2018-19 report card. It gives um, an overview of, as I said, progress toward the targets, and this landing page here sort of gives you the feel for what's happening, but the real power of this is that you can drill down in much greater detail, and we can have a look at individual region and individual catchment results per report card. And so for the 2018-19 year, as far as progress towards those reduction targets of 70% for nitrates and 20% for sediments, this was the, the story that our data was telling us. So we weren't seeing a lot of progress in this region. Um, obviously, as would be expected in this region, the um, ground cover was really good. Um, the wetland story is pretty positive. And as I said, we're currently undertaking an independent review of these land management targets, so the way that we measure this will change. But the story of the last, of the 2018-19 year was that we didn't see a lot of change um, in progress towards those targets in the Macaulay Sunday region. So I'm happy to dive deeper onto this with everyone I'm here all day and we can get into the nitty gritty of it, what's driving those scores and where that's all coming from. 
but I might leave it there so we've got plenty of time for questions. Okay. Winner? Thank you, Carl. Can we give for a round of applause, please? So thank you very much. Right. Is that one? Oh, I'm being challenged today with the um, oh, the tag. That, that's all right. If I go this way, just shut up. Is that helpful? Okay. And if I go escape, no. Stop. So the problem we're putting my presentation forward is that now you'll have all these questions about how do we generate those scores, what's happening in the marine environment, how does the management practice um, reporting work, and hopefully through the presentations from today you'll get a bit more of a, a solid picture of how that all works. But I'm happy to take, oh, Renee's got a process for questions. I, I do, that's all right. I always have a process. I'm one of those people. Sorry, guys. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yes, please feel free to grab your phone if you have any questions or comments for Carl. Also, something I forgot to mention this morning is that we will check with the speakers if it's okay uh, just to send through all the slides after the presentations. I know some of them are quite detailed, so we'll um, make sure that we um, send through the, the ones that we can after the presentation. But yes, please feel free. Take a few moments. Uh, do you have any questions or comments or feedback on what you've just heard? And I'll pop up here. Yep, that's done. There we go. Oh, Thanks. Okay, well, the first um, question's all on Jane. So Jane's going to give us a full presentation on the marine monitoring. How's the marine monitoring done? Oh, yeah. Wait and see. <laughs> so there's, there's a question that we prepared earlier, so that's coming. Okay, is the report card vetted and approved for release by government, the public, and industry? So we have a process for review of a report card. Um, we have what we call a coordination and advisory group, which is a, a, a team of people who develop the report card. Um, they get together and do a, a first review of all of the elements of the report card, and then we have an independent science panel. Now, the independent science panel is made up of nine senior retired and semi-retired um, scientists from across various disciplines, but the disciplines covered in the report card, so um, social and economic, uh, landscape sciences, water quality, uh, a whole range of things. And they review all of the elements of the report card. We have um, a number of meetings with them and everything's reviewed through those guys. Um, so that's for the technical rigor of the report card and the scientific elements, the technical elements of the report card. And then um, the report card then goes to both the Queensland Australian Government Environment Ministers for joint release. So it doesn't get released until both of the Australian government ministers have signed it off, and concurrently with that, uh, we do a, um, a pre-briefing with all of the industry stakeholders. So, um, a force cane growers, um, we we basically sit down with them prior to the public release of the report card and go through all the results. It's not a review; it's just a, an early release of a, an embargo release. They get a look at that, and we, we involve regional groups in that as well. Okay, lots of questions. Does the paddock monitoring cover all land use types? Adam's going to go into a bit more detail on that, but um, no. Um, we have a, a separate urban program that we're developing now. And Talon, are you, uh, Bonnie, are you going to talk about some of that, with, um, the urban results of the urban stewardship program? Um, I think we'll have a bit of time at the end, so all those extra little bits. We had a bit of a focus on water quality, but we can talk about that at the end. Yeah, so um, we are expanding our, um, our reach into the urban space, um, and there's also some plans to look at public lands and other management, but at this stage, the report card looks at um, grazing, sugarcane, horticulture, bananas, grains. Yep. And Adam's gonna give a really detailed presentation on that later, so you'll get a good feel for that. Oh, quite detailed. More detailed than I get. Um, Why aren't we seeing a change in the water quality um, for this region? Adam, what, have you got something on that? Uh, really. So the best way to that. it'll be based on the information that's coming to us from the, um, the land management reporting. So the, the bulk of the data that comes to us for what has changed in the landscape comes from government investment programs. 
we get a little bit from other places, but the bulk of it is from what's being spent by the two governments on ground. And so if none of that, or if very little of that change information is coming through to Adam's team, it won't be reflected back through the results of report card. So that's probably the main mechanism for change in the results is when change is reported to us on ground. Uh, and if we're not seeing a lot of that change reported, it won't be reflected in the report card itself. Is that? Yeah, I thought there was some, was some water quality improvement. When we, when we drill down into the detail, you'll probably, we'll see some more. Um, the change was at a smaller scale than what I presented. So if you go into the individual catchments, you'll start to see um, change at some of that individual catchment scale. So the um, Cross the Pine, the Pioneer, uh, the O'Connell, that sort of river system scale is where we were seeing the change, but it wasn't aggregating up. So uh, it was probably the scale at which I presented that information was probably too high to see a change for this region. But if you drill down and start to see a bit more of the nuances in the data, and that report card is a really good place to actually drill into the detail and can actually get in and see what it was that was causing the change or the lack of change. Um, pesticides. I think we don't have a water quality monitoring person here today. I can tackle that. We um, pesticides are measured in our end catchment sites through a range of grab samples. We dump a bottle in the water, send it off to the lab. They do um, two types of analysis to look at the polar and the non polar herbicides uh, and as a sweep they do a sweep basically of known herbicides that are used in the region uh, and we get those results from the lab. We also have uh, some automatic samplers that uh, sit at the end of our catchments and they're taking during the flood events they're pumping samples into the bottles which are then going to the lab. So it's laboratory analysis um, is our way of detecting pesticides um, in the end of the catchment. Did anyone want to expand? Is there anything specifically you wanted to know about pesticides? Whoever answered that, asked that question. There's a suite of 22 pesticides that we mostly look at. And when reporting pesticides, we're not reporting the individual concentrations of each pesticide. We're reporting the combined um, effect of those pesticides through something we call the um, pesticide risk matrix uh, metric. And we, we look at what the impact of those concentrations and the duration of those uh, exposures on the, the critters that live in the waterways are and we're looking in our targets for 99 percent protection of um, <coughs> water systems at end catchment and that's what we're reporting in our um, in our report card so it's the percent of the species uh, in our risk framework that are potentially affected by that concentration and that duration that we're, seeing, that we're testing at the end of the system. So that's how we do pesticides. Yeah. So on that topic, is there a plan of expanding the number of pesticides you're testing totally? Just the concern of bringing new pesticides into the marketplace, we're going to move away from old products. Yes. Because we're getting the result from those products. Yeah. And move to new products. Yeah. And you're not testing for them. Absolutely. And in a lot of cases, we don't even have laboratory analysis for a lot of those things. So we're, we're working with um, uh, the APVMA and others, uh, for working with the labs on trying to develop methodologies for those new, uh, Connor and Philip, I can't even say, say some of them, some of the newer pesticides, we're working on how, on just techniques in the lab to detect those. Um, and some of them <coughs> don't even have um, guidelines that we can report against because what we're detecting in the stream of the breakdown products, uh, and there's no guidelines for those breakdown products. So we're working on all of that with the labs. We have this long-term tension in the report card about um, trying to report trends, so locking our methods down and not changing our methods every year, so that what we're reporting, we can say as a result of change in the catchments, not just change in our methodologies. So the way that we do that is we lock our methods changes in for five years and we report using the same methodologies for five years and we store all of our technological improvements, our lab improvements, we store them all up for five years and implement them all at once and then also hindcast what the old um, scores would have been using these new methods so that we can get some sort of a longitudinal look. Um, is that a hand up, Ken? <coughs> Oh, you, you finish what you're saying. Yeah. So we're, we're always 
obviously the scientists are always wanting us to change the way, not bring in new methods, use the latest and greatest technology, uh, but we try to um, maintain it for five years so that we can start to see a trend in the data. We are always looking at those um, new and emerging chemicals, particularly as you say, because the landscape there is changing really quickly. Yeah. Um, uh, it takes... It's also where the pesticide surveys come in. So we're trying to uh, and Adam's team are actually out there looking no, no, at... not us. Not no, so, survey, right. uh, Rick Catchments, you guys are probably playing a bit involved here. So Rick Catchments each year to try to get to us, to Paddock to Reef Hull, uh, as a whole, um, some surveys from farmers about what products they're using and that sort of stuff. So that's really about us trying to keep a bit of an eye on what's out there. So if there is new emerging things, so the suite that they test for is you know, whatever the said before, 23 or 4 or something like that. Um, if there's a lot of new things turning up, then it's like, it's a bit of a trigger going, okay, well, we need to start looking to see whether that's actually important sort of thing, so. And, and the way this metric that I briefly talked about works is that we, so whenever they bring in a, a new chemical to market, they have to look at the, the sensitivity of a whole range of different species to that, and we plot those, all of those results for hard lives of different, sorry, of um, <coughs> LD50s, of um, the different critters. We plot them all on a curve from most affected to least affected, and we put that into our um, pesticide metric, and so we overlay all of those sensitivities up to the pesticides in this really fancy metric. So every time we have a new chemical, if we bring in that sensitivity for a new um, chemical, that changes the results because it's now a different, another factor in our metric. So we're really careful about uh, how often we update that pest metric and it'll be five years at the, at the least. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there a burning one here? How many more? How have I got time for? I've got plenty of time. Look. Um, where did the 70% target for DIN come from? So again, um, remember that's from the anthropogenic, so that's the human um, generated element of the load, and it's based, and, and Jane was involved in this project as well, we had a look at what the um, thresholds in the receiving environment were, so what water quality started to impact seagrass health, or as far as uh, nutrients and sediments, and we looked at the water quality guidelines in the marine environment, and we ran the ERIS um, marine model to have a look at what the current load was contributing to that and what the concentrations at the, the sensitive ecosystems were, and we looked at then what sort of reduction would be required to meet those marine guidelines and those marine thresholds. So how much would we have to reduce the current load so that we can have concentrations on the seagrass beds that support healthy um, seagrass. So they're the sorts of things, that's how we, we ran that process and then we correlated that to regional water quality improvement plans and other projects, historical projects. Um, we're, as I said, in 2022, we're going to be reviewing those. Um, so we'll be having a look at those, uh, that 70% target. But it's based on what's required in the marine environment um, to maintain healthy seagrass, coral, and inshore ecosystems. How'd they go, Jane? Yeah, good. <laughs> um, how the local government reef plan 2050 actions audited, and that's the question we cut off. Oh, I'll step on this one. So I'll take this to mean um, local government activities against Reef Plan 2050. Is that where we're headed here? There's a few different elements in this question, but yep. Yeah, the start in the Reef 2050 is um, actions of the ASO government, so it's interesting to see how we do it. Yep. 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 So as I said, my component really is in on the water quality improvement plan and the water quality components of that. Um, there is, in the Reef 2050 Water Quality Improvement Plan, an action to set local government targets for water quality improvement, uh, and that will be done in the next review in 2022. But what we've been doing is um, working with local governments to develop an urban stewardship 
urban water stewardship framework. Uh, and so we've been working um, with a range of, and I think and we might have a chat about this in the regional report cards, because that's where this assessment will, we'll see how we go. That's how this is, this way of this assessment will turn up first, but we are looking at basically reviewing local government activities in relation to water management um, and evaluating all of the local government activities um, against this urban water steward, water stewardship framework. Now, Paul, but basically we've done the pilot for that project just last November, um, and the results of that pilot will be released later this year for, for this part of the world in the management. Um, what do you call it? your management report for the yeah. management report for the um, Carl Sunday Isaac um, Healthy Waterways report card? So we will see the first um, version of those um, that reporting of urban practices um, later this year. And Scott, that's have you been involved in that program at all, Scott? Or yes, you have. So that's our that's our key way of um, of interacting with the urban. Um, stakeholders at this stage. So I'll probably just for one more question. One more question. Anyone got a favourite question? <laughs> we need a like button, don't we? So this is a tricky question. Now, how do we determine whether sediment is anthropogenic or naturally occurring? Um, so we have a range of um, historical studies of uh, coral core monitoring, looking at what's been received in the, in the marine environment in the coral cores as far as um, tracing of, of um, isotopes of nitrogen and um, different sediment cores. We have um, historical studies for um, what's been going on in catchment and the rate of change in catchments of sediment nutrient generation. We have studies in relation to um, what's coming out of undeveloped versus developed areas. And all of this goes into our catchment model to develop what we call um, a, a baseline model. And that baseline model is what we use to say what the pre-development load from each of the catchments, what, what we predict that pre-development load would have been. And so we use a model of pre-development based on a range of studies um, to come up with our anthropogen. So we look at our current load, take away that modeled um, pre-development load and that gives us our anthropogenic load. So that's how we do that. Graham, how do they go? Yes. Graham's <laughs> <good. laughs> um, our catchment modeler and Graham's going to be presenting some of the results from our catchment modeling for this part of the world later on. Yep. I uh, just uh, uh, interested in that model question in the middle. Yep. Uh, just wondering if that's been included. Um, so the EFF works only really, really new. So, like the stuff that um, the, the Kangaroos project EFF for 60 or whatever it is, only really, really new. The results are just starting to come out now. So we haven't included EFS as such in there, but um, what we can do is include the reduction in the fertiliser applied. That's, that's pretty easy to include in there. So we won't necessarily include it as an EFF, but it's that, that get that 20% reduction in the fertilizer applied. That's that's available. Stool zippers, um, there's, there's been a couple of trials on it and it works really well on some soil types and um, doesn't on others. So I think there needs to be more work done on stool zippers just now. I think that uh, maybe not so good on others might have been based on middle hybrid.
pressure in some of the systems, it's not being captured in the questions. Yeah. So, like the nutrient applied and those sorts of things in the P2R questions and that, it's not coming in what form of nitrate it's being applied and how it's being applied. So it's still being told there's X amount of nitrogen being applied, but it's not being asked how it's being applied. Yeah. And that's where it's the being reduction put. in the amount being applied. Yeah. So it's it's being I wouldn't be captured. Yeah, well when it's being applied, some surface runs as well as they just made the first reduction loss isn't being captured. Yeah. 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 Is that is that maybe something we can we can put on our action list perhaps to to discuss later? Or um, do you think it's important to, to cover that now? Um, what do you think? Oh, look, yeah, EFS can be captured right now. Stool zippers is, is um, certainly something we can, we, yeah, we, we sort of had had a big, well, previous versions of Paddock 3 did have a section in there for surface, subsurface applied fertilisers. Um, surveys were showing that it was like 95 plus percent were going subsurface. Um, yeah, so we sort of took that, that section out. So still zipper closes the slot more effectively to how it was. Um, so it's just something that we sort of took out a while ago and, and just went, oh, well, it's all going subsurface now. Um, it's possibly something we need to look at a bit more. Um, again. Okay. Very time for one more comment and then we'll just add that to the, the list. Yeah. Uh, I think it's really important to include because we focused on going subsurface, but the reality is if you've done that, you can set up adverse water quality outcomes. The, the better indicator is compacted soil cover over the fertilizer band, and that's what the zippers are all about. So yeah, it certainly, it certainly reduces runoff, no doubt. Yep. Um, there's still an issue with drainage, <coughs> and that's, that's the dominant loss pathway in a place where you get We did have a comment here, so I'll just hand over to you, Sarah, and then we'll move on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you make a good comment there. It's probably not just the whole issue doesn't just revolve around a couple of little practices as well. There's a whole host of other practices that aren't fully captured by P2R because the questions don't involve enough detail. Um, just something that springs to mind, irrigation efficiencies, runoff, all that sort of stuff timing of application. So probably timing is one of the issues that, that is uh, probably one of the biggest issues that comes up with the P2R questions. So I think those questions need to be expanded to cover as many practices and changes in practices as possible. Thank so you. as I said earlier, there's an independent review of the management practice adoption reporting um, and the targets, specifically the targets and the way that they're reported against happening now and they're going to come in um, early next year with their recommendations and that's likely to change the way that we monitor and report all of this. So depending on what our targets are going forward based on that independent review, then we'll have to look at how we report against those targets. So that may change um, some elements such as the questions and the way that it all happens. We don't know what that looks like because it's an external process. Um, so there could be a lot of change in the way that we report on management practices in the future. That's good, that's good to know. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Adam, for that. So uh, what I've done, folks, is I've just um, started a list of action items up here. So just to make sure we don't lose that. So um, the speakers in very catchments will be able to take those away and um, just follow up where we needed. OK, so Bonnie, would you like to come up and, and get yourself all set up? And we will now hear about the regional report card. Thank you, Bonnie and Mr. John. Tell I'm so sorry. Bonnie and Tell and take it away. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, there's a few familiar faces in the room. I've been here about six months and there's a lot more people to meet. Um, based on some of those questions at the start, I'm hazarding a guess that um, 
there's a few of you like me, and this is your uh, first page read for them. So for the old hats in the room, I'm sorry for some of the repetition and stuff you'll hear and um, some of the basics, but hang with me. Uh, so yeah, my name's Bonnie Stutzel. Um, I replaced Charlie Morgan as the Executive Officer for the Healthy Rooster Reef Partnership um, in December last year. Um, for those of you, I thought, the other thing I thought I'd do quickly is just give you a little bit of background to myself. So um, I've worked in uh, well, a bit of everything really. So I've done a bit of stream flow monitoring in the Snowy Mountains. Um, I've also worked as a flood modeler in Brisbane, but most recently I joined most of the people in the room that are sitting on the um, agricultural side of things. So before this position, um, I was working in drone remote sensing for agriculture and uh, fiber optic sensing. So we've got a broad brush spread of everything there. Um, and if there's anything that you want to chat about in those spaces, then yeah, come see me at lunch. But kind of just a caveat that there's a lot of shared knowledge in this room and there's a lot of indicators that go in the report card. Um, and having been in the role six months with that diverse background, I'm probably not going to be able to answer all your questions, but let's get going. So I just thought I'd start quickly with um, what the partnership is for those people who don't realise. Um, so we're a collaboration of uh, local industry, um, NRM groups, traditional owners, uh, lots of different organisations. Um, I was actually quickly, if everyone just wants to look around, if you're representing one of our partner organisations today, could you just stick your hand up? There's a few people I've chat to this morning. Yeah, there we go. So if you want to chat to any of the people with their hand up about um, what it's like to be involved in the partnership or where we're going and what we're doing, then I really encourage that at lunch as well. Because it's really the partners and um, what they're advocating for in the local region that drive what we're doing. Oh, good spot. Just now, the most recent partner to join was the um, Tangaroa Blue Foundation. Uh, and we're not going to talk about it today, but they've joined to come on board because we're working towards putting um, a marine debris litter metric into the report card. So if that's something that you're interested in, then watch this space um, and we'll talk more about it as we lead into this year's report card. So this is quickly, um, I was going to introduce you to Talon and then also so Talon Rimmer here is the technical officer for the team. He's doing a lot of heavy lifting on uh, developing the report card for this year at the moment. Uh, the rest of the team, there might be a few new faces on there too because we're all new team. So not one of us in the team except for Talon has been through the report card process yet. So um, we are talking today about the 2019 report card results because that aligns with um, what Carl's been presenting. Uh, our new results are coming out for the 2020 report card in July this year. So that's what this team's most familiar with and has been heavily involved with, but we'll chat you through the 2019 results today as well. Um, just quickly while I've got you, I think the other one I wanted to make you aware of is Melissa Nixon as our new comms officer. Um, so if you've got any things you want to talk about in terms of waterway health, uh, speakers you'd like to see in the region and those sorts of things, then uh, get in touch with either her or me and we can look to organise that. Uh, I think just quickly, just to focus in on the region we cover, is um, a Pie Week Sunday's Isaac. So right from um, Flaggy Rocky Creek in the south to Home Hill in the north. Just trying to move, because I think it's a walking people on either side. Yeah, that's a good um, Yeah, so the beauty about this report card and the reason that I'm passionate about it, um, you might have before when I said, oh, I do drone science and I did ag, and you'd be like, why did you end up in this role, Bonnie? Um, other than being a bit of a COVID casualty last year and having to move back and find a job, the thing that I'm super passionate and I think the power in this is um, advocating for those regional outcomes. Um, growing up in regional New South Wales, I think the power of having, you saw everyone that put their hands up as partners before coming together to try and work and collaborate on better water quality outcomes for the region. So I guess that's what's driving us and you know, that's where we sit, the beautiful Mackay area, with Sundays and Isaac. What do we do? Um, so two things, the first one is each year and the main driver for bringing the collaborations of all the organisations together is the report card, so the Waterway Health Report Card. Um, we'll present some results from the 2019 one today. And then something new that actually, I think it was our partnership that led it across the state was to develop 
there's a lot of those questions, I, I think they came up before, about when you see these results, why they aren't changing or what are we doing to get um, improved results in the report card. So alongside our report card, it comes out a bit later in October, we um, also do like a stewardship management sort of response, highlighting all the good things that are going on in the area. Um, last year, the focus was on all the things that our partners are doing. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in becoming involved in the partnership, come approach me. And if you're actually one of these people that doesn't think that you get enough airtime for the good work you're doing, um, getting involved in the partnership and getting on board with these sort of documents and getting it out there is probably a good way to do that as well. Cool, so um, how do we fit into the picture of everything else? Um, Carl had this slide up before. So for those of you not aware, there is uh, currently five partnerships. Um, we work pretty closely together. They've also got a couple of new staff and it's been a really good learning experience to see what they've got going across the region. Uh, we collaborate where we can on saving staff time on our shared metrics, but we also try to keep um, some of those things that we need to keep regionally focused, so things that are more important for us here than, say, Cairns and vice versa. I thought this one would probably come up, uh, so I do a quick job of addressing it now, but how, what is different between regional report cards and the reef report card? Um, is that something that everyone's clear on, or? I'm gonna stop speaking for a second. Just put your hand up if you think you're 100% clear on what the difference is, or at least 80% between the regional and the reef report card. Yeah, no, there's like four, so it's fine. Um, yeah, so even when I started in this role, this is a question I was asking myself and I've drilled down into over the last six months. Um, the main difference is A, that we're just covering the regions and those indicators and things that are important to the region. We do have, um, we'll talk about it at the end if we get some time, a lot more indicators than just um, water quality and waterway health. We look at human dimensions and cultural heritage and those sorts of things. Um, but the big one really is at the moment we're just ambient model, to model, model the ambient monitoring, not modelling. Like in the future we might look to putting some model results in. But um, so that means that all our results that we're reporting on are just a snapshot in time of when they were collected, um, and they're just looking at the concentrations. They're not looking at um, as compared to Carl's results that look at loads and um, models for outcomes. So yeah, that is really the, when you're thinking about these results, the main one. Um, and I'll just, I'll give you a little tip here. When you see the 2020 report card come out this year, um, one of the things I think that we struggle with is that, that lag time. So there's that, we report on the financial year. So this, the report card we're talking about today, I even struggle to explain it sometimes, but the report card we're talking about today is from 2018, June through to July 2019. And then it gets, release the next financial year. Um, and so the one that we're releasing this year, the 2020 report card, covers 2019 and 2020. Uh, and the reason I'm just sort of highlighting it now is that because we're in amb ambient monitoring, um, climate also feeds into a lot of what we do. So just keep that in the back of your head um, and think about that, I guess. I think I've probably harped on about this already, but the other main difference um, is just that we focused on regional priorities and we're also a mechanism to be able to advocate for those regional priorities. Um, and if you have any data gaps in the region in the report card space, we're always looking to fill those as well. So it's, sorry guys over here, it's all. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's the, the main thing, yeah. And the other, the other one, if I touch on it at the end, that we have as a partnership, as a goal, is better involving the community and educating the community in our waterway health. Bonnie, yeah. the, a key difference between the reef report card and the regional report cards is that the reef report card is reporting progress towards those targets that yeah. I talked about, whereas you guys are talking about the condition of the local environment. So that's sort of the, the key thing, is you guys are looking at what the current condition is, or where we're looking at, how well we're progressing towards those water quality targets in the reef water quality improvement plan. Much better explain, Carl, thank you. Yeah, so uh, just quickly, for the, so you don't have to listen to me drone on, um, we're gonna hand over to Talon because he has a lot of the work um, 
in the technical side of things. So he's going to report on the results from the 2019 report card and also just step you through uh, a little bit about how you form an indicator and what looks what the report card looks like. Uh, yeah, so tell them. Thanks, Bon. And now you're going to listen to me drone on that. Thanks. Can everyone hear me okay? Is that, is that fine? Cool. I'm going to try and, try and angle myself properly. You might have the clicker, sorry. Thank you. All right, so what I'm going to be talking about today, um, as Bonnie mentioned, is a little bit of uh, where we're doing our monitoring and what exactly we are monitoring. And I'll be focusing largely, uh, Tariq, um, on our estuary and freshwater water quality today, but happy to discuss um, other questions you have as well afterwards. And I'll be giving you, as Bonnie mentioned as well, a little sneak peek into what are some good, good news stories that came out of our 2019 report card as well. So where do we monitor for our freshwater and estuaries? For those of you who are well aware of the region and our catchments, we monitor five different catchments from the Don all the way up around Bowen down to the Plain Basin, which is split into Plain and Sandy Creek. And then for our estuaries, um, we go all the way from the Gregory down to the Carmilla in the south of this region. We have eight estuaries in total that we monitor. I will note as well that this doesn't take into account things like, as Carl mentioned, you can talk about later, our urban water stewardship framework, which uh, reports will be reporting more on um, the council area rather than just our NRM area and these estuaries itself. But this is for large, like I said, our water quality focus for today. And for our data sources, um, as Carl mentioned, we actually use a lot of the same data as the GBR report card. Um, we use some paddock to reef data from the catchment loads monitoring program for our water quality data for our catchments, and then other data as well from the Department of Environment and Science um, for our estuaries. We have an estuary monitoring team that's kind enough to go out to each one of our eight estuaries in the region and provide us data from those for our water quality as well. And then we have a similar uh, methodology to what Carl mentioned as well, where we send those results like pesticides, uh, nutrients, off to the lab. We make sure that they go through the same process as the GBR report card largely as well, similar technical review, and then they're reported in a similar way with a annual, somewhat annual report card. Um, we also have a good number of partnership funded projects. So Bonnie mentioned we have 31 different partners um, who all contribute, come to the table, a large table, not quite as large as this one, but still quite large. Um, and they get to have their input on what we do. They get to say, you know, look, I'm really keen on learning more about the Carmilla estuary, for example. Can we do more monitoring there? Can we monitor fish in our estuary environments? And then our job as our team is to try and work towards that and uh, bake those ideas into our methodology and our strategic plan for the partnership. So some of our projects are indeed funded by our partners. That's what I think is so cool about our partnership as a whole. It's entirely community, government, and industry driven. And then we also have some input as well from our local regional councils, like with our urban water stewardship framework, which because we're talking about our 2019 report card today, and this is a new framework, I won't dive too much into that, but if we have any questions at the end, I can cover that as well. So what do we report on? If folks have ever seen our report card before, um, I know we have a vast number of partners in the room, you'll likely see a coaster that looks a lot like this. Um, and I'm gonna break it down. It's not as complex as all these colors seem. Essentially, we start with one thing that we can measure. So for example, think of measuring nitrogen in a waterway. We physically can measure nitrogen and that becomes what we call an indicator and we correspond nitrogen levels, ambient condition, to a score. We have a methodology that gives us a grade for nitrogen, so we can say nitrogen gets a B. And then if we have, for example, nitrogen and phosphorus that we measure, we combine those indicators to what we call an indicator category. We average them out to nutrients. So we can say nutrients in our report card for a specific waterway gets a grade, and that becomes a grade for indicator category. And then say, for example, all the water quality indicator categories, nutrients, chlorophyll, phys chem, those all get rolled up into what we call an index. So water quality would be an index for our report card, and we give that a grade as well. And then ultimately, for all indexes for our report card, 
say for example we have, we have like water quality, fish, and like habitat hydrology, those all get combined to get an overall score for one basin. So it looks something like this. So I don't know if everybody can see this, it's kind of small lettering here, but here we have laid out all of the different indicators and indicator categories that we monitor for our freshwater basins. So we have our water quality stuff here, like nitrogen and phosphorus, but we also monitor things like riparian extent, wetland extent, pest fish, fish communities, fish barriers, quite a lot of different data here. And I will say, and I'll give a plug for this at the end as well, this is all these data are all end up to be available online that you can look up at any time. And if you want to have raw data as well, we might be able to help arrange that depending on what data source it is. So please use us as a resource. Oh, before I move on to, Bonnie mentioned this, but I can't stress it enough. The one key thing to mention between, or um, keep in mind between us and Carl's GBR report card is again, we are ambient conditioned. So when we talk about nitrogen in a waterway, that's the concentration of nitrogen that we're monitoring at that one specific time. Whereas Carl talked about like the total amount of stuff and nitrogen flowing through a waterway. We're like, well, how much nitrogen is there in comparison to the water in a waterway <coughs> at one time? And just to show a quick layout of our region and our basins that we report on, we have the dawn up there with our sampling site, our crosser pine, and each one of these dots represents one of our freshwater monitoring sites in the region that we get from the catchment loads monitoring program. And for estuaries, it's a little bit different. I should have increased the screen size a bit more in hindsight, but all the way up there, we have these blue dots where we monitor estuarine um, sites in the region as well, down the Crosser Pine region, Pioneer, Sandy Creek, and Murray as well, and St. Helens. Okay, and now I will talk to you a little bit about some takeaways or good news stories from our 2019 report card. Again, I apologize due to the lag of the report card. I'm talking to you about stuff from the 2018-2019 financial year. But if you look online on our website in July, you will get to see um, more relevant stories as well from the 2019-2020 year, where we update these same indicators again. So very quickly, a few method updates occurred in 2019, which are all interesting. Uh, we had our fish barrier assessments in the report card were updated, which showed large areas of interconnected stream habitat in the dawn. We had coral and pesticides were reported on in the south of our region for the very first time, which filled a good knowledge gap. And we had our most robust estuary pesticide monitoring program um, started since the partnership's inception, thanks to our kind folks at Reef Catchments, who are, some of who are here today as well. Um, and that allows us to get a more concrete and clear picture of pesticides in our estuaries for the region. And I, meant, I mentioned these monitoring updates because all three of these are entirely partnership funded and driven. So just showing that at, at our table as well, um, we are making some progress based on folks' ideas and contributions, which I think is really great. Um, just harking back to what Carl said before, so he mentioned modeling in the GBR report card and how with that modeling, they're able to tease out things like climate. So because we're monitoring ambient condition and monitoring things in a little bit different way, we have to contextualize our results before I get to them with the climate for that year. So for example, in wetter years, in like if we have lots of months with higher than above average rainfall, we're more likely in our report card to see things like increased sediment getting churned up in our, in our estuaries and our basins as well. So we have to mention that we have key messages for our report card, not just grades, to contextualize any score changes that we have. So that's all you should take away from this graph, is just that we always contextualize our report card in the context of the climate for that year. Okay, overall for our results for the report card, we had grades across the region here. This is what our report card looks like. That ranged from Ds to Bs overall. Um, our inshore zones were a little bit worse than, for example, our freshwater basins or some of our estuaries. We had most of our grades were the same as the previous year, those ones circled in blue there. And we had two scores improve 
relative to the previous year. This is uh, Murray and St. Helens Creek, which improved in score um, from a C to a B. And then the northern inshore zone, which also improved from a D to a C. And then two scores uh, decreased relative to the previous year, which were the Gregory and the Vines. And I'm just thinking in my mind right now to 2019, I believe those were both driven by decreases in water quality um, in those estuaries as well. And just showing you that overall, our rating system for grades is, is similar to Carl's. Now we have a kind of an E to an A rating system as well. Um, so none of these grades are down in the E range, and none of them are as high as the A range. They're all sitting in those three in the middle. <coughs> but five good news stories that you can take away from the 2019 report card, if nothing else from this presentation. <coughs> Overall estuary grades in our report card have remained relatively stable since our inception in 2015 in the overall. So those uh, Bs and Cs that you saw there on the screen a second ago, those uh, more than likely for those estuaries haven't changed too drastically uh, in the five years that we were around when their support card was made. Second thing is that the condition of mangrove and salt marsh extent, which we also report on in our estuaries, uh, was good and very good with our updates um, for the 2019 report card. Important to mention, for things like mangrove and salt marsh extent, while we update our water quality grades every single year, things like wetlands and mangrove and salt marsh extent, we update um, either every three years or every four years, um, depending on logistics and what time we think is necessary. We also had water quality in the offshore zone uh, was remained in very good condition for the sixth consecutive year since the report card's inception. And that offshore juvenile cor coral density scored uh, very good, indicating a greater, greater potential for recovery there. Um, and then the last one that I want to talk about was that the Vines Creek, the O'Connell, the Gregory, and Rocky Dam all received grades of good for our fish barriers, um, comprising large areas of that connected stream habitat. Fish barriers is again one of our partnership funded projects um, led by folks at Catch and Solutions. Um, and then the, only a few fish barriers were located on the smaller tributaries and with no low passability barriers as well. It's a really interesting indicator. Um, if you want to talk to me more about it afterwards, please feel free to. Or I know we have some folks from Catchment Solutions here as well. If you want to know more about our report card, please use our data. This is a screenshot off of our website. Um, you can click through to each indicator itself see how it's been in the last five years, look down into each individual indicator, um, come and chat with us about what we're doing in the future. As Carl mentioned, we have a few other projects that will be getting um, up and going here soon, including the Urban Water Stewardship Framework, which will be capturing for the first time what local councils are doing to help um, urban water stewardship and what they're doing against government targets and stuff like that. All right, back to Yvonne. Thanks, Tom. So I guess leading on to what Talon just said, um, and <coughs> as today is all about having your phones out for questions, um, maybe I can just see why you'll sign up for our newsletter for this year's um, results. So if you're interested in seeing this year's results that are going to be launching in July, the best place to do that is to just get your phone out now, scan the QR code. Um, it'll take you straight. I tested it yesterday, but you know, once you, when you put these things up, they never work. But if it does work, it should take you straight to the um, newsletter sign up. And that comes out sporadically about four times a year, but there'll be the next one that will definitely coming out when these report card results are out. Um, and that will also provide you with more information on how to get to the website through that newsletter and just how to get in touch. So I'll leave that up for a second. It's going to be great. Do it. Um, just quickly, why I've got this up and why you're on your phones. I just also wanted to thank uh, Reef Catchments for the chance to speak today, but particular um, Peter and Stacey sitting <coughs> in the back corner there for all the effort that's gone on to put these on. I think, you know, anyone who's organised an event and there's a few of us in the room, a lot goes into uh, behind the scenes to get them, get everyone here and get it going. So yeah, thanks Peter and Stacey for all your work. And also Jonathan standing behind the camera. Thanks Jonathan. I 
everyone's got that, I'm just gonna quickly with the last minute show you some of the other stuff we get up to. Um, and then Renee just shuffle me off because I'm kind of. <laughs> so a core part of what we've been doing too is educating the community on waterway health. Um, a couple of the things that we do is we get involved in some of the coast care activities um, with Carolyn and reef catchments. Um, and the top picture there is an activity around what is a catchment um, that was run at Harbour Beach recently. Uh, that, and then next to that is uh, Joe the Parrotfish. So Joe the Parrotfish started as a marine debris sculpture um, out of all the, all the, sorry, all the marine debris that's gone into that sculpture was collected on the local beaches around here. Uh, he was commissioned for our stewardship document launch last October. And since then he's been traveling around the region. Um, so he's been out to the crib room in Daly Bay out there. Uh, he also went down to um, Cape Palmerston. I'm going to say it right today because I've worked with the locals. If you say Cape Hillsborough and no Cape Palmerston, you get getting mixed up. You get booted out of the room. But um, yeah, so he's been down to Cape Palmerston Caravan Park for Easter. Uh, and also on our website, if you signed up for the newsletter, if you've got young kids, we've got a, the competition's closed, but there's a colouring in of Joe and you've got a QR code on there that you can go and um, see what he looks like and do the colouring in. Uh, the other thing that's been happening recently is in April, a um, few familiar faces in the room from that, we ran a um, water talk in the pub up in Fossifine um, and we had a guest speaker, uh, Steve Attard, came along and talked about smart irrigation and um, all the things you might want to do on farming considering that aspect and then also Ryan Turner came up and talked more about um, some of the things that go into the water quality monitoring that Carl was talking about. So we're always keen to get people that you want to hear from um, into the region. So yeah, get in contact if you, there's a speaker or a topic that you want to hear about um, and we'll see what we can do about putting something on. And finally, um, at the moment, because you know, there's lots of little pieces going on, uh, Melissa Nixon, our comms office, has put together this really awesome um, photography competition. So if you've got friends and family in the region uh, that love to do a bit of photography, We've got a thousand dollar gift voucher for Garrick's Cameron House up for grabs. Um, and even better than a thousand dollar gift voucher is you might have a chance to feature on the front of our uh, next report card, the 2020 report card. So um, if you want to know more about that, it's on our Facebook or yeah, come up and see me afterwards. But that's a good opportunity for any buddy local photographers at the moment. Cool, thank you. And I look forward to meeting those that have them in the break, hopefully. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, Tal. Um, so while I get our Mentimeter set up here, our, our phone um, feedback, are there any questions from the floor for Bonnie and Tal? Otherwise, you can ask them here. Here we go. This should come up on your phone. If you want to enter anything through your phone, let me know if it's not working. Could you just explain on the report card before how you had the, like on the, on the land, you had CCC and then offshore was a D. Is there a relationship between the sort of land and marine, or is that a completely different story? Oh, <laughs> no, you. <laughs> I'm Canadian. Um, anyways, yeah, yeah, so that's a great question, um, and one that I asked Mike in this role as well. The D versus the C, so I see D for inshore, whereas like some uh, water quality with C. The key there is what we set our grades against. So we have something similar to what Carl talked about, but in a different way called guideline values. So the guideline values are what we say that, okay, how relevant to the natural environment are these, these inputs um, in the region, or these concentrations? So what I can only say there is that the guideline values of the inshore might be a little bit more like sensitive in some ways or different to what we're measuring against for our freshwater estuary. You're totally right in that the, what happens obviously in our catchments, you know, healthy rivers to reef, it does go out into our inshore environment. But there's a lot of factors there aside from your guideline values, things like currents, whatever else is happening in the marine environment, that makes it so that we can still get those differences quite a lot um, in our grades. 
Does that kind of answer a little bit of your question? I'm going to add Just before you guys jump in, I was just going to say, um, I'll, I'll let the people that are better to answer this question answer it. But the other one um, is we have those questions a lot, like what's impacting on water quality in the region? Um, what happened the Whitsundays that was a big thing was uh, water clarity um, in the tourism industry up there. Uh, so this is where the partnership got involved and um, got funded and um, put out a report you can find on our website about what impacts water clarity in the Whitsundays. And it's kind of that link between land-based activity in our region, but also um, once you move into those inshore and offshore environments, you can imagine we've got a lot to do in this region, but we're also getting impacted upon by other regions across the coast. So I guess that is another add on to your question, and then I'm going to hand over to Carl and Jane to do a better job, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's been explained pretty well, but there's time lags between what comes from the land and then when the marine system will see that response, but also the other factors. So in the marine environment, we have some direct impacts potentially from dredging, for example, so that'll affect turbidity in the marine environment not necessarily linked to runoff. Um, and it'll also depend on, um, I guess, the amount of runoff that you've had. So we have some particularly dry years where you may not get that sort of large flushing into the marine system and less of an influence, but it can still have influence in the catchment or end of um, catchment water quality. So, um, I mean, everyone's answers are correct, but yeah, we do see those, a bit of a disconnect in the timing between how the system responds as well. Yeah, I was just going to um, highlight the importance of those guidelines and the impact that those guideline numbers have on the results in the report cards. So we have these, these Queensland water quality guidelines across the state that say um, what the thresholds for what's good for water quality, what's bad for water quality are, and they're different in the catchment, in the inshore environment, so in what we call enclosed coastal waters, and then we have open coastal waters. So we have a different water quality guideline for sediments and nutrients in those um, estuaries, in those enclosed coastal waters than we do in the open coastal waters. And there's a history of, it, of what data those guidelines were set on and where those guidelines, who set those guidelines, and there's a big difference. So with the, there's much higher guidelines. You can have dirtier water in those enclosed coastals than you can in those open coastals. But in reality, the difference between those two water bodies, there's no line out there that says this is enclosed coastal, this is open coastal. Like the, it's, it's just you're going from here to there, but there's a change in the number of that you've got to get for water quality. And it's a significant change. So it's a big number, so you, you, you find, you're fine in those enclosed coastal waters, but as soon as you get to those open coastal waters, it's a much tighter guideline. And there's a whole range of historical reasons for that, and that's one of the main drivers for that CD change. And we're working, supporting um, reef catchments to try and look at um, updating the reef water quality improvement, uh, the Mackay Sunday regional water quality improvement that looks at get it collecting data to inform those guidelines so that those guidelines can be set um, more appropriately um, for the region. And so we're supporting reef catchments in trying to get an update to the water quality improvement plan, collect some more data, and hopefully find some, uh, get some more um, regionally specific data to inform those guidelines. And that should mean that those, it's not such a big jump between those enclosed coastals and those open coastal waters. So that's part of what's driving that score. Do you feel like you got bombarded with answers to one question now? <laughs> um, right, what's, is, what's the next one on here you want to pick, Terry? Um, well, I don't know about that. Are we expecting better water quality results with the next report due to better water weather conditions? Um, do you want to answer that one simply? I think we, we're not going to really discuss or we can't discuss what the results are coming out in July, but I did um, give you a bit of a heads up before that uh, climate's going to really drive those results um, and it was a very dry year that 2019-2020 reporting year so in some ways yes but in other ways no and I think the other caveat when you sit here and you go oh but we're doing so much in the region and not seeing results is that some of these things do take a lot of effort and a lot of time um, to result in changes based on some of the ways they're set and also just that we're looking at whole catchment stuff so 
Um, yeah, that's one thing there. Your, your pick. Have we got time? Yeah. Go back to the fire person. Um, sorry, with regards to the fire one, um, great question. I, we've talked briefly with experts about this. We don't have a, an indicator for this necessarily. And keep in mind, we only report on certain environmental indicators. We don't report on like trees, for example, uh, across the fire scarred region. So we can't really comment on that, sorry. From what we know of. But can you comment on that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Funny, so we did see some interesting results in the satellite imagery in the remote sensing last year. So around that period of the fires, we saw a lot more, um, uh, I guess, it's almost noise in the signal and we're starting to see some patterns which we thought were related to water quality but we're understanding now are probably more from smoke in the southern Great Barrier Reef. I don't think it was detected as far um, as the Mokaiwit Sunday region, but it does sort of influence some of our outputs um, where we're using that sort of satellite imagery to look at that. So in terms of direct um, actual input or impact on water quality in this region, I would assume, it would, I would expect it would have been fairly limited. Thanks so much. Uh, I was just gonna pick this one on the side quickly. Um, if I've understood it correctly, you're asking if there's uh, opportunity for positive feedback to land managers. So people that are uh, trying to see those water quality improvements in the region. Um, at least for the partnership at the moment, um, the main way that we're doing that is through either highlighting good news stories in our social media or with that uh, stewardship reporting document. So if you're part of an organisation that's not part of the partnership, um, and you'd like to see some of your local stories and feedback. Um, some of these, like some of some of what you're doing, linked if we can link it to the report card results. Then getting involved in the partnership and um, having some of that highlighted in the stewardship document would be a good idea. Uh, outside of that, in terms of feeding positive results back, um, yeah, it's going to be through that document or also through um, the report card launch. Any of those positive news stories. Uh, just because we are at the whole catchment scale too, like it's really hard, I guess Carl can talk a bit more about this later, but it is hard to really pinpoint um, some of those drivers sometimes in terms of management change. Um, sounds good. Um, just quickly, uh, the local report card including urban development projects, um, or only totals, focused on total uh, large industry agriculture. That thing that I mentioned before about urban water stewardship is probably, again, a, our, our best example of that, where we were local councils um, to ask them, you know, how do you think um, industry and yourselves are working together? What kind of things do you have in place? And then we give that a grade and, and quantify, I guess, the risk that that might pose to water quality in the region and how things are doing there. Um, we do actually have a, a, a non-agriculture section um, that we report on through a few different ways, stewardship and our website as well. Um, and that's, so not just agriculture, we also have some other components to the report card like uh, cultural heritage assessments, not related to water, water quality itself, but we work with traditional owners across the region as well um, to map culturally important sites, uh, things like that. So there's a, there's a fair amount to the report card as well, other than what I've just spoken about today. Yeah. Um, for the adoption of land use, frameworks, uh, please come talk to us afterwards. Cheers. Thank you for that, guys. Um, and yeah, just a reminder that we will actually send all the questions that come up here. We will be sending them to the speakers afterwards. So if there's anything that doesn't get answered, um, the speakers will do a brief written answer and they'll um, circulate that afterwards. So. All right, wonderful. Thank, thanks, guys. Um, Adam, would you like to come up? So we have one more presentation before lunch at 12. And we have Adam from the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries. Thank you. So I'm Adam Northey. I'm with the Paddington Reef Program based <coughs> in uh, I work for the Department of Agriculture, DAF, based in Rockhampton. Been with the program about six and a half years now. Um, we're in a we're in a group in team of five of us at the moment. So Kev McCosker is uh, the team leader, there's myself, uh, Emily Barbie, uh, Rob Hassett and Paul Humphreys, so and we trying to look after this management practice adoption program part of Paddy Tariq, um, which I'll try and explain now. Yeah, 
other. Okay, so Carl put this slide up earlier. Um, and we... I've got that little laser pointer. No, that turned it off. Don't press, don't press that button there. <laughs> so, this one's a laser pointer, that one. Okay. So, we sit here in this land, as Carl explained earlier, in the management practice adoption part of the land stewardship, part of Paddock Taree. So, the way I like to think about Paddock Taree is here at this paddock scale here, where we sit, what we're trying to do is protect where there's been a practice change. So where a farmer has changed, gone from one type of practice to a different type of practice. We have the loads, uh, the paddock monitoring teams, so, um, such as Ken up the back there, and what they're, they're doing is going, okay, we need, if you're doing this type of practice, what sort of losses are we seeing from the paddock? So how much setup, <coughs> how much nutrient, how much pesticide? If you're doing that type of practice, what's the losses sort of thing? So where our two teams work together is that when we say you're going from this type of practice to that type of practice, we can then try and estimate what the reduction in losses are at a particular point. Where the modelling fits in, the paddock modelling is we can't monitor every single type, every single spot where that is. So we can't go out to a farm and go, okay, you've changed practice, we better monitor that. So then we're trying to attempt to model what happens when we change those. And, you know, different soil types react differently, different rainfall reacts differently. So paddock modelling fits into that. Now the paddock modelling feeds into this catchment model. And as we know, you know, catchments have wetlands and riparian vegetation and that sort of stuff. So sediments falling out, it's being picked up in pumps and all that sort of stuff. So catchment model moving it through and then it ends up in the marine section. Okay, so our primary role for the uh, management practice adoption part is to monitor the impact that investment, invests, investments have on adoption of improved land management. So really where about the investment side. So reef 2050 and the water quality improvement plan sits underneath that. Um, and that's what our program is set up about. Um, so we're about monitoring oops, the adoption of that and then reporting against that target. So this target here that just popped up, 90% adoption of, plan, of um, best practice. We also provide data to the, the modelling team. So said before when we said when we go we change from this practice to that practice we provide that over to the modelers plug it into the model and then able to go okay all these farms have changed practice and this is the the result this is the the reduction in load at the end of the system we also provide feedback back to the funding bodies so the australian government the queensland government uh great barrier reef marine foundation uh, yeah great barrier reef foundation um, on the effectiveness of their program so one of our milestones is provide that feedback back to them and we also get out and about as much as we possibly can and try and help people to to work with the system become more efficient in the system and that's the target that we're interested in so when you look at reef plan there's a whole heap of um, different parts of reef plan but the target that that we report against is this 90% adoption of best practice um, for water quality in the priority areas. Okay, but where did that target come from? So back in 2009, we first seen a land management target. Now this first target was 80% of landholders in agricultural enterprises should have blah, 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 will have adopted improved soil nutrient and chemical management practices. So just improved practices. So what we're looking for there is any evidence somebody has improved the way they work. Um, there's the water quality targets there that changed a little bit. So in the early days, what reporting was into the paddock tree system was, we did a project, so project one, 
We worked with this farmer here, so there was a unique farmer ID because there was that number of farmers adopting improved practices. So we need to know how many farmers we're working with. Uh, they've done some, they're in this industry, they've done a bit of work, they've got a bit of funding, and this is the, this is a description of what they were doing. Certainly in the early days, our role was just counting. We just counted, this year we had to have an estimation of approximately how many farmers there were in a region, and then we just counted. The, the farmers engaged in the program. In 2013, that target got updated. It became 90% adoption of 90% of sugarcane horticulture at property, grazing lands are managed using best management practice systems. Slight change to the to the water quality targets. And that's remained largely the same into the 1722. Target. So this is the current target we're working under. As Carl said, this is under review now. I'll go into that a bit later. So the big thing that changed here is that we added in 90% of land it was a change. So we there was a shift from area to land. So we, it wasn't about counting landholders anymore. It was about counting area and managed using best management practice systems. So before it was just about improving practices. Now it's best management practice systems. So that fundamentally changed the information that Paddock to Reef needed to know to be able to report against this target. So before we were just counting land holders coming in. Now we need to know where, how far, where are we in relation to 90%? Are we at 90% or are we at 5%, how far away? What the other big thing that at this time is what is best practice systems for water quality? So I'll go into that in a minute. Um, but we needed to know really how the farm was managed. So not that they've made an improvement, it's like, well what what improvement were they what practices were they doing before to what practices are they doing now and are they at best practice now? So, water quality risk Department works came in about that time. So this is the 17 to 22, there was one developed for the previous one, the 2009, which showed out that one. So what, what we attempt to do here was describe the practices that are part of a system, so the system in the target, soil management, so this is the soil management one for sugar cane. So we're attempting to list the practices that have the biggest influence, not the ones that have, we don't list all of the practices that have an influence. So there's lots of practices that fit underneath the soil management or nutrient management. What we're trying to do is list the ones that have the biggest impact. And then what we're trying to do is describe levels of adoption of that from the riskiest level of adoption to the least risky level of adoption for the soil management. These are really informed by this document here, the, the scientific consensus statement. So this is the 2017 one, which is kind of the one we're still under. Uh, there's a new one being worked on now, it comes out in 2023, something like that, yeah. Which? Next year. Next year, comes out next year. So scientific consensus statement and supporting that is this one here, so chapter four. Chapter four is about land management sort of stuff. So this one here explains a lot of, um, it gives some context around the practices we're interested in. <coughs> so we've defined best practice there. So now we've gone, okay, this is the level that, that we need people to achieve is this sort of area here. Now we need to know how far away from best practice are. How far away are we from this 90% uh, target? And that's where we have these benchmarks. So what we did was we used um, data we already had, so we've been collecting individual uh, data, like reported data about projects that have happened, so we had a fair bit of that. Um, we did some additional surveys uh, with uh, local groups here, did some surveys one-on-one -on -one with landholders for us. Uh, we we put 
we've got SRA to do some sur grower surveys in their grower survey that they put out every uh, year, every couple of years. Uh, expert advice. So, you know, there's people in this room here that know a real lot about their area or, you know, or they work on a specific thing and know a real lot about that. So we use expert advice into that. And basically what we come up with is an estimation of the area that's managed at those risk categories. So that forms our benchmark. So this one here is actually the 2017 benchmark for the whole of Mackay uh, with Sunday area for sugarcane. Uh, we maintain this actually down to, a, to an individual um, individual basin. So, you know, uh, the, the Cross Pine, uh, O'Connell, Pioneer and Plain. Um, and this is what we're then measuring against. So when we're talking about progress, we're, we're measuring against this. So each year, what we're then trying to do is is go out and have a look and see what things are happening out there and or getting reported to us. What are the things that are getting that are happening out there? And we're analysing these sorts of things. So incentive programs where uh, growers are getting a grant for a new bit of equipment or fencing uh, or uh, whatever sort of thing. Compliance programs, extension programs. Uh, big system repair program. So in this region, there was uh, there's been quite a bit of work done around repairing stream banks up the Cyclone Debbie, I think. Um, so we're looking at all of that there that we can get given to us. We analyse all of that data there, and then we update those benchmarks each year and report that into the report card. So what does that look like? We an individual farm. So imagine we get. We, I think for sugar cane last year, I think 1,700 farms across the Great Barrier Reef were represented, uh, about 600 grazing properties, a um, handful of banana properties, 20 or 30 grains properties, and about 50 or 60 horticulture properties. So property looks like polygon on a map, a farm boundary there, obviously for different blocks, all that sort of stuff comes with a set of set of management questions on it. So people, some people be familiar, more familiar than others and hate our uh, P2R questions. So, you know, we'll have the questions there that say what they're currently doing and what they're moving to. We take these questions and analyze them and go, okay, for soil, you had a moderate risk for lot before and a moderate risk after. For nutrient, moderate, you've moved to a moderate low risk for nutrient. Uh, I should have said pesticide. So we go through, we analyse each one of those and we look at them. So, um, you know, the 1,700 of those all went through a process of us looking at it. Um, we also look backwards because we don't want to represent this project too many times. So if this change happened last year and then it turns up again in the data this year, we need to make sure that we're not double counting. So we go through a process there run through all of these program, pro, all of these individual projects and go, okay, this one here has a moderate to moderate load change. And say this one here is, you know, whatever, 200 hectares. So we now know that 200 hectares has moved into that best practice or nutrient management there. So then we can go back to our benchmarks and update the benchmarks. So that's sort of first part of what we do. That's that informing that 90% target. Now the second part of what we do is we then inform the model. So we take that data about all the different practices and that sort of stuff, and we go, okay, we look at the, at the model and we go, there's a simulation that was done in the paddock model that best aligns with how this is. So this is an example of what a simulation looks like to, to us. So I know what that means, not many other people. It's just a code that aligns with a specific simulation that was in, in the AppSim suite of runs that they did. And we say, use this one before and use that one as after. So we get a polygon with a whole heap of practice information that 
Paddy Tariq questions sent to us. We run through a process of codifying that down into just a handful of things like this. This polygon and this code gets handed over to them, only to the catchment model, modelers, only to the catchment modeler. Doesn't go anywhere else from there. Um, and all of that data about the practices that sits in our database that's secure, secure to the five of us in the program. So nobody else sees this data. Nobody in DAF can see this data. Nobody in Queensland government can see this data. Just us. So I guess what I'm trying to make here is, though we do ask for quite a bit of detailed data, what we do with it is codified and then we round it up. So you'll see in the report card we report a plain creek level or the, or the pioneer level. You'll never see us present individual farm and practices anywhere. You won't see that. You'll, like this year is obviously it's a farm, but it's an example farm um, and some practices there. But you'll never see any data about individual growers' data come from us. Okay, so we've run through this process and we've gone, that 200 hectares has gone from that moderate risk now up to a low risk. So we then go back to our initial benchmark. So 2016 benchmark, the other tips use this is actually grazing hectares, so that's why there's so many. We go back to our original 2016 benchmark where we have an estimation of how many hectares or how much of the area is managed using those different levels. And then we go, well, we know what the area is of grazing, probably in the Fitzroy or the Burnham, given the amount of hectares there. So we have an estimation of how many, how much area of sugar cane or grazing or whatever there is in a catchment. So we can work out, calculate out the hectares there. Then what we do is we then add up all of the hectares that have moved. So that farm I showed before, it was new hectares into this moderate risk. So you know there's 200 new hectares in here or coming into this. We, we have to track the, where they came from to maintain a balance in, the, in these numbers. So then we go, okay, well they came from here. So what we're looking for is the area coming from this moderate high risk, coming out of moderate and high and going in to low and moderate. And that's what we're seeing. And then we just add, we calculate that back and add it up. So we've gone, um, we start with these hectares, we add in any new hectares, we, we minus hectares that have moved, and we end up with a new lot of hectares and we recalculate. And you'll see here in this example, uh, in this lowest and moderate low, we had 1.2 and 31.7, and then 1.5 and 33.1 percent. Uh, percent in those two there. And then those two numbers there, they get combined and reported as what is best practice in the report card. And this is what we're looking to, to see. So this is actually screenshotted out of the report card now, which you can go and have a look. So, um, you know, what we're hoping for is seeing this high and moderate risk area reduce, and these green bars here, so the lowest and moderate increase. So this here is, uh, I'm not sure where it's from, but this is a good story here. We're seeing these higher risk ones reduce and the other ones increase. Okay, so that's how we currently do it under that last target, on that 90% adoption. So I put this one up, This so this is the water quality improvement plan, uh, 17 to 22, that's the one that we're currently working under. Beginning of the year, ministers came out and said we're going to update. Uh, where does it say? Do I have a line? Come on. Yeah. So independent review of land management target. So that means that the land management target that sits in this document is going under independent review. So there's been a tender go out for an independent person to look at it, and I believe they're discussing it this week uh, as to who will be the who they're going to select as the tender. Uh, provider and then there's a process where they have 
to consult with and it says so here industry and stakeholders will not consult throughout the reviews. They have to consult with that, the, the industry advisory group that, that will be set up and managed and that sort of stuff. Um, which which I think reef catchments uh, are a part of, cane growers are a part of as well, I'm fairly sure, uh, QFF are a part of. So essentially, this target year is pretty much gone. What replaces it with, I don't know. And the big thing about that, so what that means is what we need to report in the future is still a little bit unknown. So the moment we're still currently asking questions as they currently are, so that you know at least if you know if we end up, at least we can still track some progress before this comes in. But it could mean that what we ask in the future will be quite different to what we what we ask right now because what we be reporting against is likely to be different. Um, what it ends up being, I don't know. We we will be advisors of it, provide data providers of it, but we won't actually be part of setting the new target. Okay. So, what's this space? And that's where I think John brought up about the paddock to reef questions don't quite match up with everything that's sort of happening in there. We've, you know, over that five years since the last the questions were first set, we've learned a lot about the things that are really important for water quality. So we we will hope well we'll have likely have targets that will be slightly will be different to what we have now, and things like John brought up. Well, we, we want to know about this and this and this. They may be things that become part of the target, and really important to know, and things that we currently ask mightn't be quite as important, so they might drop off a little bit as well. Okay, so so. P2R projector. So I give it a little and the update to P2R projector. So I'll give it a little bit of a history of P2R projector. So before I came and worked for DAF, I actually worked for Paddock to Reef, uh, worked for um, worked for the Fitzroy Basin Association and uh, worked in their reef program sort of thing there. So I did a lot of the you know designing of programs and and you know, working out which land holders we're going to fund for incentives and that sort of stuff. And, and one of my bugbears back there was we just didn't have, we didn't have a system that said, here's one farmer doing this practice change and here's another farmer in a different spot in the landscape or slightly different hectares doing a very sim doing the same or a very similar practice change. What we didn't know and we were quite often oversubscribed to our grants program. So, you know, we would we would ask people, we'd ask farmers to, you know, put in a, a proposal for stuff they wanted to do. And, you know, we had enough funding to fund 50 of them. We'd often get 60 or 70 people interested sort of thing. So we just didn't have a way to know which one. So when I came over into Paddock to Reef, this calculator it's sort of been simmering along in the background and people had talked about it and I sort of picked it up and went right let's actually push it and see where we can get it and that's what projector is so projector is really designed around looking at these and going okay if I've got two two projects here different parts of the landscape different whatever which is the one that I should prioritize my work with over the other one that's that's what its job is that's what it's designed about So, when we first set it up and first built it, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to use 2020 versus 2021 throughout this. So, in 2020, we we had it up and running. It's it's using a system that is paddock to reef like in that it uses very uses pretty much the same logic that we use when we run through the analysis of the questions. It uses annual averages out of the paddock modelling um, and uses some real average delivery ratios and that sort of stuff as well for, from the catchment modelling. So in 2020, in 
2020, it was built and it was displaying results right at the edge of the paddock, right at the edge of the field. So we were growing crop, it was transporting sediment off and it was displaying at the edge of the field. That, that was what it was set up for, but that was the way it was built originally. <coughs> In, 20, in February 2021, so earlier in this year, there was a pretty major update to it, and it affected this region probably more than anywhere else. In that we now added what we what we needed to display was get it to better match the results that we were generating in the whole paddock tree modelling. So paddock tree modelling is about the end of catchment. So this edge of paddock is not what paddock tree is doing. We're talking about out to the reef. So, we know that when water leaves a farm, it's not going straight to the reef, it's running through, you know, on field, wetlands, drains, that sort of stuff. It's then running through riparian areas and that sort of stuff before it's getting to the stream network. So, we've implemented a couple of things in here. The first thing we've implemented is a delivery to stream ratio. So we're dropping out a lot of sediment and nutrient in these things. Right there in areas of filtering out a lot of that stuff as well. So it's interesting, yesterday I was in the Burdekin and we were looking at, at a constructed wetland up there and they, they were do it, they're doing a lot of monitoring of that wetland and they couldn't, they couldn't work out why the numbers but the, the concentration of tin coming into the wetland was so low. And what they eventually worked out was the, the water channel that was bringing the, the din to the wetland was about eight, 900 metres long, and it was all grassed and fairly flat. And in that process there, they were actually dropping out most of the din through that. So they were monitoring this here. So this is uh, work from Bifnac up there, um, one of the local community monitoring program. So right here they're getting quite high concentrations, but what they were getting dropping into the constructed wetland was quite low, and they put it down to this, these grass waterways were dropping out a lot of the nitrogen and, and sediments and stuff that was coming down. So that's the first thing that happens here. So a lot of, a lot of the din and pesticide is dropped out before it even gets to the stream. So the next thing that was implemented is the catchments, you know, farms up here are a lot further away than farms here to the station. If we're worried about what gets the end of the catchment here, then we can't treat farms here the same as farms down there. So, you know, roughly 10 k's from here to here, 40 kilometres from there to there. So you've just got, you know, four times the, the, four times the amount of distance that a particle of din or sediment has to travel from here then from here. So there's, an, there's another um, factor that was built into that is a catchment one. So we're getting up here in, in areas like this, you still get fairly high delivery in that 40 kilometres, um, but that's the other one that, that has reduced results a little bit as well. So whilst it probably doesn't matter a huge amount for sugar cane and dinning sugar cane. When we jump over into the other commodities we're interested in as well in grazing, sediment generated here in Alpha or above Alpha, which is still in Great Barrier Reef catchment, has to travel a bloody long way before it gets out to the mouth of the birding. So it's about helping prioritise the area. So in this instance in grazing, it makes a big difference. If you want to save sediment, you don't work here. And that's me done. Is there any questions? Or are we going to use the Mentimeter oh, we, we thing? We will or? use the, the Mentimeter, yeah. But sorry, <coughs> just before we get into question time, I've just been reminded, there are some bottles of water around the corner. If anyone's feeling a little bit dehydrated, if you haven't been sitting for a while, please feel free to get up and grab one. But uh, yes, I'll put Mentimeter up. But yes, if um, anyone has any questions from the floor to kick off, I thought that would be. John, Adam. Um, Here you go. Give it a talk, say everybody. Um, I don't envy your job because there's always somebody chasing your tail. Whether it's landholders or government, they want an answer one way or the other. Um, a 
suppose for me the biggest issue is that, and as <coughs> you've seen with all the reporting through the P2R uh, projector, is understanding that there's a lag time and you're going to get less DIN runoff at the actual estuary than you are from the paddock. However, if you don't have the inputs correct from the paddock or the right amount of losses from the actual paddock, you're never going to get the right answer at the end of the catchment. So I suppose it's not been critical as much as the changes that have occurred, but my issue has been, and, and we we basically spoke on the subject a little bit earlier, is you've been, you've been asked through Paddock to Reef and GBRF to determine a certain amount of NUE from, from certain projects that, that have been done, whereas the projector was basically built around practice change. So people like Ken can give us the answers, but we don't actually have that in the projector. And I understand that you have to maintain certain benchmarks so that you're not changing the rules every year, in which case it's going to give you the wrong answer anyway. So it's a bit of a dilemma. We have a, a E grade for a kite with Sundays, knowing that all these practice changes have been done, but they're not being captured by, by the model. In that you have made some practice changes, but actual changes on the ground are slightly different to the questions that are being raised by the P2R project. So where do you see us going to update the issues that we have? Yeah, so there'll be, I think there'll be, there'll be a couple of things that will hopefully address that. So the, the E grade is that around the reporting of that 90% adoption. So if we don't have a 90% adoption target and we have a target that's different and targets that are both so that 90% adoption target is across the adoption of soil, new soil, nutrient and pesticide. Now in this region the vast majority of the funding is going towards nutrients. So you're seeing slow adoption in pesticide and sediment, which is dragging that the the overall adoption of improved practice back because it's it, it's across all three of them, so it's dragging it back, it's holding that back. So if we have targets that are more around um, the things that are actually gonna make a difference in a particular catchment, whatever they may be, then we don't have to report against adoption of control traffic or whatever it is, that there's not much effort being looked at at the moment. So hopefully we'll see the days of big E grades and that sort of stuff have gone. Because I, I find that's really um, disheartening, you know, sort of thing for for you guys doing the work. Like, you guys know that you're putting in the work and that sort of stuff, whereas the way our system set up, how it was set up, is it's not capturing those changes. And, and you know, it's... And I also hate that the, there is a lot of data that sits in the back end and a lot of data crunching that we do to come up with one number. Like that's really, you know, when you, you put in months and months of work and you have one number come up and it takes years to change that one number is really hard um, thing for us to swallow as well. So that'll be one thing. We're always, so the models being, will be re, so the, the paddock model as well will be rebuilt or updated. So we, we hit the end of that cycle. So. I think Carl said before, we try and lock it into a five year cycle. So we're comparing apples with apples sort of thing. So now there will be an update. So there's a lot of new science come out. EFFs is a, is a really good example of new science. It's just coming out now. So we're hoping to get that into the next, next model, which once the model is updated, we can then look at updating the data in the back end of the projector. So it's sort of update paddock to reef, and then we can look at updating projector at the back end of that. Does that answer what you were kind of after? It does. Um, I guess uh, it's not definitive enough, and you can't be definitive until you get down to the nitty gritty. Um, yeah, and what all, the target all really is, is going to be that. Yeah, all I'm saying is that we've got the wrong information being fed to government, 
and, and every other single body that doesn't reflect the actual changes that have occurred. And I know there's a lag time, yeah. and I know you've got these issues, but I think it should be something that should be highlighted. Yeah, and you know, the, the report card is designed around reporting kind of thing, so it's stuff that you guys are putting in, but we've, we're making out as though that's the only thing happening. It's not the only thing happening. Like There's, there's improvements happening all the time through, you know, off grab like that or through extension that's not refunded that just isn't captured there. So this five year cycle, there's a review of the, there's an update of the risk frameworks which is being done independently, but we will, that'll result in us updating what our current benchmarks are as well. So we'll do it, we'll go through a similar process to what we did last time and come out to the regions and go, okay, well, Let's try and pull some data together about what are the practices out there and that sort of stuff. And hopefully we'll have a bit of a up, we'll have an updated benchmark that's more reflective of what we're seeing. So if we're seeing 60% of the area using EFFs or something like that, then you know that's something that we want to make sure that we have into the into the new benchmark to inform going forward. Yeah, um, just a, a comment about a, another dilemma we face, and it comes down to management scope. So we've sort of got you know, a marine park, catchments, farms, blocks, uh, within blocks. But based on the work that Mike Bell's been doing at UQ for the last three or four years, we're actually now managing the first sphere, which is that zone right where the fertiliser band is. And it's almost counterintuitive, so this is its bindings. We're actually managing ammonia what it comes down to. So, you know, you don't talk about ammonia in sugarcane circles, but that's what we do. So, uh, if you're using urea blends, we're managing ammonia. So, a complication is, there's scientific papers published on this, Apsom is a model which gets used quite a few times. It just has, hasn't got ammonia in that model at all. So, it's, it's potentially one of our big lost pathways, but it's just not there. So um, we, we've sort of got to resolve that as well. So at the moment, the best science probably isn't good science, but if we're aware of it and we fix it, it's, a, it's only going to be to everyone's better. But yeah. It's a, a big one as well. Really yeah. Big one. I, I, yeah. I wish we had a paddock model here that they could explain, because I've spent the last couple of days with those guys, and I know they're building or there's just recently been built of the labelisation model into Absinthe, which wasn't there in the past. Um, there's been a lot of talk about uh, just having a look at the the monitoring, marine monitoring, uh, the catchment monitoring program and see. So I'm pretty sure that they sometimes pick up urea in the water as well, as opposed to nitrates sort of thing. So having a look at that as well and try and understand how we're getting in the water and you know what's what processes all that's gone through and that sort of thing so yeah that they're, they're definitely trying to improve that side of the model yeah, just one final thing about the ammonia and the urea one thing is uh, going to fix that is the spill service so it's this whole integration of everything and whole these technology management and we keep going forward yeah we'll factor in Is there a projected tool for sediment? Uh, so the current one does sediment um, in sugarcane, in cropping. There is one we're developing for grazing. Um, and I have a working copy at the moment. It's producing numbers. We just have to look to see whether it's actually realistic. So I'm hoping that the grazing one will be out. Uh, that's up twice. I'm hoping the grazing one will be out in another few weeks to, to a month sort of thing. It's very, very, very close. So it produces records, produces data, looks pretty good. We've picked up a few bugs in it. We're hoping that we have it up and going. Uh, 
Uh, so if people are going to identify areas where investment should be prioritised, anyone but the P2R team access this information? Uh, so there's a couple of things. So we try, we've, we've worked with um, the uh, different regional bodies about providing aggregated data, particularly from the catchment modelling side about where there's hot spots in the region sort of thing. So we can try and go up through the region, go, you know, a lot of sediment coming from here or a lot of nutrient coming from there. So we'll try to work with regional bodies on that. So some, oh, and I don't, I'm not familiar with this region's WQIP, but some of them have that data there. Uh, that is definitely stuff that, that you know, RAM can help out with the hot spots in there. Um, as far as, the data about management, we, 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 evolved, we provided scaled up at a regional level, catchment level, so whoever wants that. We can't provide stuff about individual farms and what they're doing. Um, we can give it back to you if you've already provided. If you provide it to us, we can give it back to you, but we can't do, um, we can't provide, a, you know, data that somebody's reported to somebody else. Survey's uh, so a question based on evidence, are the survey questions and replies evidence-based or statement-based? Um, they're, they're basically, I presume what this is asking is do we need evidence that, they, that different practices are being adopted or are we happy to take people's word for it? Is that what we think? Right. Yeah. So pretty much what we, the way we approach this is we go, well, you guys, this is your region. You're the ones out there talking to the farmers. So we trust you as the first step. Um, and that's pretty much how we go. We do try, if where we have different lines of evidence, we do look at it. So um, in grazing, we would use uh, like ground cover metrics and that sort of stuff. So. Uh, where we're getting told, oh, they were a poor grazing, now they're getting better. If the ground cover trends don't match up with that, so out west, um, in the bigger catchments, you know, you can look at the ground cover at the time and go, well, they've always had high cover, probably managing their grass pretty well. So we do do that in some instances. In sugar cane, there's not a real lot of other things we do. So we'll look back in time, so if if a farmer's engaged with somebody in the paddock to reach system multiple times, we will have that farm represented in our database. So we'll look back and if, if we're getting told, oh, they're going from this practice to that practice, but it already, that practice change has already happened in, in our data, then we don't, we can't count it a second time. So <coughs> what'll happen is the, the change this year won't, won't get pushed through. Uh, the delivery ratio has greatly affected the estimated water tables expected prior to the update. Um, so, were we expecting it to impact, project the water quality outcomes to impact as much as they did? Uh, no, it wasn't what I was expecting. So, I knew that it would impact on it. Mackay's got quite a low from from paddock to stream ratio, like quite a lot lower than any of the other regions, which was which was a surprise to me. Um, so I didn't didn't expect it to be that high. But I guess the thing is, is that we now represent projected now more realistically represents what's shown in the report card. So we were running a little bit of a danger of saying we've got all these huge water quality outcomes happening. GBRF, we're going to report that. And the report card was never going to show those water quality outcomes. So, because the report card has the delivery ratios built into it. Which means that most of what you're saying is all. Okay. Should management change in the upper catchment, which leads
used to reduce sediment be prioritised opposed to lower catchment locations due to the cumulative impact on the aquatic ecosystem, reduce stream capacity concern. I uh, don't know how to answer that. That's kind of not how, it's not something we sort of really looked at. Um, I guess the, the, the idea is about Bit my objective is there's there's a lot of work needs to be done and there's not enough funding in the space to do it and not enough capacity like there's just there's not enough people to be able to do all the work that needs to be done so the project is really about trying to work out with the work we're doing now where is the better the best spots to work but it's plus, yeah it's not something that I'm actually qualified to talk about the cumulative impact on the aquatic ecosystem, but it's possibly something that should be thought about in the system design. Jane, I'll have a start answering. Oh, oh no, I was just thinking, Mackay with Sunday is probably <coughs> one of the main regions in the reef that has taken a whole of system approach in their thinking from the beginning, so recognising the value of the reef ecosystems, but also of the freshwater systems that um, connect to those. and so. I think that's a really valid point. Our end point is not just the reef, it's, it's um, the catchment communities as well. And in fact, that's probably what people connect with most. And so the focus of the region, I think here, um, is an absolute credit to the people working here because it's a really important aspect. I don't know whether there was any others there. Is there any other questions before I sit down? No, I think my everyone's ready for lunch. I think. Can we give that a round of applause, please? It's always a pretty presentation. Um, really great informative presentations this morning. Uh, now, after lunch, we're going to um, hear from Ram now from the Department of Natural Resources and Mines about uh, the catchment modelling part of the program. So, how that all works. And then after Ram, we'll hear from Jane and she'll talk about the Marine Monitoring Program. I know we had a question earlier, so uh, this will be a really good opportunity for, for folks who are interested in that stuff. And then lastly, we'll hear from um, our local projects, so uh, Sandy Creek and James Creek. And then we will uh, do a bit of a wrap up at the end just to get some feedback from yourselves on how you found today and just clarify where we're going from, from here. All right, so Ram, can I hand over to you? I'll get your presentation up on the screen. So the next big question is, can, do we really need modeling or can this be done just by monitoring itself? So the simple answer is no, we need modeling. So the first reason, why, need, why do we need modeling? Is to differentiate the water quality improvement solely due to improved land management practices. 
Okay, so what does this, what does this mean? So this is the flow uh, recorded at Pioneer River at Dumbarton between 2016 and 2018. As you can see here, due to the climate variability, more the rainfall, you get more, uh, more flow recorded at the gauges. So you can clearly see the climatic pattern in the recorded rainfall. And this is the sediment <laughs> measured at the exactly the same gauge uh, by the GPR loads monitoring team. So here, the observed water quality trend is due to a combination of local climate variability and land management improvements that were adopted so far. So it's really important for us to differentiate uh, the land management improvement from the climate variability to understand um, what's going, going on with all the investment and etc. So that's one of the reasons. The first reason. And the second reason to understand the water quality conditions in ungaged or unmonitored areas. Because monitoring cannot be done everywhere due to uh, financial and uh, uh, limitation, limitations with the finan uh, finance and uh, access and safety issues. And the other one is to assess the efficacy of proposed future land management scenarios. Because monitoring can only detect water quality improvements uh, that are seen due to the land management practices that, that have been already implemented on land. Okay, so this is the Makai Sunday, the existing catchment model. It covers the whole region, which is about 9,000 square kilometers, and it includes all four recording basins, classifying O'Connell, Pioneer, and Plain. Okay, let's into the modeling approach. So, in terms of modeling, we try to incorporate loads of different data, spatial and temporal data, data which includes climate, land use, soil, etc. And we model sediment and find uh, fine sediments and nutrients uh, as well. And we try to capture the key processes. So for example, in Makai Sunday, the hill slope erosion and stream bank erosion are important when it comes to the fine sediment. And sugarcane farming is important when it comes, it comes to the dissolved inorganic nitrogen export. And then modeling is evaluated against long-term monitoring data. We'll go through a bit of input that we use in our modeling. As we all know, the fine sediment and the dissolved inorganic nitrogen generation change from one land use to the other. So in our models, around 10 different land uses we represent based on QLAM data. Also, the soil properties like soil erodibility and nitrogen and phosphorus content in the soil also vary from one place to the other. That means the soil, the generation of those uh, pollutants are, will vary as well. So we, we incorporate different soil proper, property layers to account for the, all those uh, different aspects of soil. Higher crop cover, you would expect lower the soil erosion could be. So we incorporate 20 years, years worth of seasonal crop cover variation in the models to predict soil erosion, the seasonal variability in the soil erosion. And in, when it comes to the stream bank erosion, your stream, stream, bank, um, stream length, stream slope, and the riparian vegetation, they are the main key factors which influence the stream bank erosion. So we, in, we bring in all those the data into our models as well. And when it comes to the management practice, and especially in sugarcane farming and, and, and grazing and etc., the, the timing and the application rates of different nutrients and pesticides, they're important as well. So they, we, we use all those data in our models. And as we all know, higher rainfall, higher generation, and higher transport of nutrients and fine sediments into the rivers. So we, we, we use temporal rainfall data in our models. I'll quickly go through uh, how we actually do the report card modeling in terms of the report card purposes. As Carl mentioned this morning, the real water quality targets are long, long term anthropogenic flow production. So we develop a baseline model which is based on whatever the benchmark data that Adam's team gives us. So this is done at the beginning of each report card year. So we run this particular baseline model over a 20 year, 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 year period 
because the targets are they are long term ones. So this 20 year period includes um, some wet years and some dry years as well. And this baseline data will then be compared against the GPR loads monitoring team monitored results to fix. So once we are uh, con 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 once we are happy with this particular baseline model, we fix this baseline model for the particular report card year. The report water quality targets are long-term anthropogenic. So as Carl mentioned this morning, the anthropogenic loads are the element of load, the element of the total load that are generated from human activities. So we need to run a pre-development or, or pre-values change model. So we, we, we use this particular baseline models and we apply a set of assumptions to, to run a pre-development model. So from this baseline model, we subtract the pre-development load to estimate the anthropogenic load. Then as a third model, we run a change model. In this particular change model, we use the management data that Adam's teams give us at the end of that um, report card year. So this particular model will be informed by all the changes, all the land management improvements that have been implemented for that particular report card year. Okay, so, so this is how. So subtraction from the baseline and the change will give, give us the load production. So the, the actual model percentage load production are estimated by dividing the load production by the anthropogen. So, and then these, these percentage load reduction will be compared against the long-term targets. Okay, this is a, a summary of what's being done in the actual report card modeling to report towards the, to, um, um, to do a group report towards the targets that are set in the um, reef, uh, reef water quality improvement plan. So we bring lots of spatially varying and temporally varying input data into the model, and also we bring in ag agricultural model data so EPSIN, it, 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 it simulates the sugarcane related processes separately. So we bring in that data, and we also bring in Adam's, whatever the management practice adoption data that Adam's team has collected for that, that particular year. And we run the models, and then we compare the model result, results against the water quality monitoring uh, for that particular year and the long term year. And we, we then estimate the percentage load production to report the progress uh, towards the, uh, the targets that are set in the report card. Okay, so now I will show you some comparisons between model versus the long-term monitoring. So this particular comparison it compares the model average annual flows against um, uh, monitored average annual flows at Pine River, uh, River at Dumbbells and Sandy Creek at Homebush and a couple of O'Connor River sites. Here the numbers, they represent the percentage variation between the average annual model load and the average annual monitor load. As you can see from here, the existing Makavik Sunday model really will uh, represent uh, the average annual flows at both Pioneer and Sandy. And it, it slightly overestimates uh, the, the flow at the, the Ogono River. This is the model versus monitor fine sediment um, comparison at, at the same four gauges. The, as you can see from here, that the model really um, well represents the, uh, the, the monitored uh, average annual fine sediment loads. This is the comparison of model versus monitored average annual dissolved inorganic loads at, at, at the same four gauges. And once again, the model, it predicts really well the dissolved inorganic, in a, uh, dissolved inorganic nitrogen at the end of system monitoring locations. And these plots, they summarize the contribution from the Makai's Sunday region to the region. Even though the Makaibik Sunday region only covers 2% of the total GBR catchment area, it contributes to 9% of the, 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 the total flow uh, to, the, to the reef. 
and it also contributes six percent of the fine sediment being exported to the reef, and it contributes around eleven percent of dissolved inorganic nitrogen that's being um, sent to the reef. This is the contribution by land use in, in the Makari Sunday region for fine sediment. The modeling indicates that stream bank erosion contributes 50% of fine sediment load in, in, in Makari Sunday region, followed by grazing 24% and conservation 13%. And sugarcane can, contributes only 5% in the Makari Sunday region. Um, uh, and this is the contribution by land use. Uh, for dissolved inorganic nitrogen, and modeling indicates that sugarcane contributes 70% of the dissolved inorganic nitrogen in the Makarit Sunday region, followed by grazing, which is 30%. A strong peer review and scientific review is, is essential for any sort of modeling. So, back in 2019, an independent review of Cashman and pa uh, Paddock modeling program was completed. Uh, a review of power which composed of three national academics and two scientists uh, from the United States Agriculture Department. They did an independent review of the whole, the whole modeling program. And the modeling, uh, the, the, the panel found that the, mod uh, the, the modeling is doing a great job and the actual review, the outcome of the review was very promising. Moreover, the modeling approaches and the outcomes have been published at conferences and in peer review journal as well. Thank you, guys. I'll bring up our, um, our feedback, but does anyone have any questions from the floor? For Russ and Ron, I guess I have a question while, uh, while we're waiting. So mm -hmm. just go to so I guess um, just while we're waiting, one of the questions I had is um, if, um, what does it take a, a while between the practice change that's made versus getting reflected in the models? So, if someone's making a practice change on their property, does it take a while for that to be reflected in the modeling? Uh, not true. That's a good question, Renek. So, in terms of modeling, it won't be um, uh, that, that particular lag time won't be reflected in the modeling, but we are comparing the model with the results against a long term uh, water quality target. So, so the, the assumption is by 2025 or 2050, which, were, which we are expecting the changes to happen. So that particular um, uh, change would would would, would have, will be happened by then. So oh, okay. yeah, but not not in the modeling. <coughs> okay. So what are the key assumptions made to develop a pre-development model, and what approx time period does this represent? Okay. So here, when it comes to the pre-development model, so one of the main assumption, what we do is we we change all the uh, the the farming uh, land uses to to the nature conservation by assuming before human uh, induced activities all, all these farming land will have been nature conservation and we use whatever the water quality properties of those nature conservation uh, to to represent that particular farming uh, land in, in, in the pre-development model. Uh, what approximate time period does this represent? It doesn't represent any of the time period in the past, but it, it, it only represents that the land use that would have been that 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 the, the, the land use that would have been um, in the past it, it won't represent any particular time period. So it's a fixed time period. So we run all the models between 1986 to 2014. We only change the land use distribution in our pre-development models. Slight typo. Just so how often the land use data change? Because we've had a lot of conversion from cane land to grazing and other crops in the last few years. Is that in there already or not? Yes, it's all. That's in there already. So we updated uh, the land use last year based on the latest QLM data. So it's about every five years we rerun that QLM depending on funding and priority. Yeah. Okay and they run up and down the coast, updating it bit by bit. So it's sort of on, a, on about a five year update cycle. Okay, so how are the different land use sediment runoff rate determined for the model? Okay, 
So, as I mentioned, we represent all the soil properties and rainfall and etc. For an example, when it comes to the sediment runoff, you would expect more sediment runoff in hill areas. So the model will have all the the, the slopes and and, 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 and and all the ground cover, etc. already built into the model. So for example, if, if a plot of land is lo lower in cover, then you would expect most erosion to happen in that particular land. So it's, it's, all, cap it's all already captured in, in the model, but based on the local monitoring data, we're trying to uh, <coughs> calibrate our model parameters. Not at the, uh, does the model reflect potential climate change scenarios? Not at the moment. We, we, we don't run any potential climate change scenarios. But within that model, we try to represent both the wet and the dry years. That's all we do. Aside from rainfall, are there other climate inputs that are incorporated in the model? Yes, in the Cashman model, we use uh, evapotranspiration data. But when it comes to uh, regions like Makai and Sunday, the actual evaporation rate during high flow events, uh, it's quite low compared to the rainfall, but it, it, it's really an important input in the absent model, and they use all the evaporation data and the temperature data, etc. Can you produce erosion hazard and sediment supply maps at subsequent stage? Is there more energy uh, erodible geology? Is we can definitely produce all those hotspot map based on uh, the, the resolution of, of our models uh, for ero uh, sediment supplies and etc. Yes, that's doable. How are things such as a weir dams model? Yes, I haven't incorporated that one in the, in the, what we call the presentation, but we do uh, represent weirs and dams and also water supply and extractions in our models. They are all in there. Is rainfall rate intensity taken into account by the modeling? Yes, it's a good question. So when it comes to the, uh, the hill slope erosion, we use uh, universal uh, soil loss equation um, to, to model the actual hill slope erosion. And rainfall erosivity, it's one of the, the model, um, uh, model input in, in that particular model. So we do account for rainfall, uh, rainfall rate or intensity uh, in a, uh, to model the hill slope erosion. Thank you. That's all right. Thank you, Ron. That's all right. I was going to offer if there was any. Um, did anyone want to rub to go any over any other bits of his presentation? I know that was quite technical. Um, feel free to to say so. But otherwise, yes, we'll let you go. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Ron, for that presentation. All right, uh, Jane. I think you're up next. There you are. Hello. Thanks, Renee. Uh, I'm Jane Waterhouse. I work with Trap Water at James Cook University and also C2A Consulting. Um, I work in the marine monitoring program leading the inshore water quality component for JCU, also working with AIMS. Um, the program's run by the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority and we've also got um, UQ, so AIMS UQ, the Cape York Water Monitoring Partnership. So <laughs> our program only has a, the bit that I'm involved in has a very small component in Mackay with Sunday. We just do event sampling here, we have flood events. So I'm trying to present to you today a whole bunch of slides from other people, so I hope it comes across okay. Um, so as Carl has described, the Paddock Terrain Program captures the whole <coughs> of the catchment terrain landscape. So the Marine Monitoring Program is the part that um, I guess requires that long-term data to assess the um, changes in time of uh, the influence of land based runoff on the Great Barrier Reef, um, recognising the challenges of teasing that out from other factors as well. It's been running for 15 years, uh, so since 2005, and we look at not only water quality but also the trends over time in seagrass and inshore coral communities. So it is an inshore program. Um, there's a couple of or fewer uh, sorry mid shelf sites in the wet tropics, so. As you go further north, the reef is closer to the coast, um, so those mid-shelf reefs tend to be closer, but around this region, it's largely just inshore sites. I've just got a video 
um, that I'll show you. It's an overview of the Marine Mon Monitoring Program. It just goes for a couple of minutes if you can do an intro. I think if I press this, it'll work. Yeah. The Great Barrier Reef is a diverse ecosystem. It contains many habitats and species. One thing reefs and seagrass meadows need is good water quality. It is essential for their health, growth, and to support their recovery. The Marine Park Authority works with many research partners to monitor the health of inshore coral reefs, seagrass meadows, and inshore water quality. We monitor water quality at many sites in the Marine Park. We do this to understand how much sediment and nutrients are present in the water. We also measure things like temperature, salinity, and other chemical constituents. We've been doing this for over a decade, which gives us a really clear picture of how things are changing over time. And my team monitors inshore corals. At each reef, we dive at two depths to capture the different communities that occur. We look at how much coral and algae there are and which species. We also count juvenile corals and record coral bleaching, disease, and other pressures impacting the coral. We correlate the community data with the pressures on the system to help explain the changes that we see. We monitor the water as well, but we focus on the wet season. We take particular interest when the rivers are flooding very, very strongly, when we sample from the river mouth all the way out to the edge of the flood point to see what's in the water. In the Cape, we work with Cape York Water Monitoring Partnerships to deliver the program. We also use satellite images, so you can imagine how big the reef is. It's over 300,000 square kilometres. We can't measure everything everywhere. So we can use those technologies to tell us what's in the water um, and where to give us an idea of much larger areas. And we monitor seagrass meadows and report on their condition. We lay down a transect tape, we put the quadrat down every five metres and measure how much seagrass there is, ranging from zero to 100%. We also measure some of the pressures that seagrass are under, and this is helping us to understand how water quality is affecting the health of inshore seagrass meadows. The Great Barrier Reef Marine Monitoring Program has been operating for more than 15 years. We value the strong partnerships with the science community and the science it provides. It helps us make informed management decisions to support a healthy reef, which in turn supports healthy people.
again in 17, so that they're unprecedented, the scale and intensity of those events. Um, but notice in the, uh, those, all of these years, we saw a sort of a reprieve in the Southern Great Barrier Reef. We had a couple of years where it wasn't too bad, and then 2020, it extended across the whole Great Barrier Reef. So what do we look at in terms of water quality? As I said, it's shared between Ames and James Cook University. Um, so the whole Great Barrier Reef from Cape York um, down to the Macaiba Sunday region are monitored year round. Um, so we've got quite a few stations, as I said, it's largely based in the open coastal or inshore waters. Um, here, focusing on the Macaiba Sunday region of great interest here, there's five routine stations, so they're sampled between eight and 12 times every year. Um, there's an additional six sites where we go if there's an event only, and that's also part of the pennant on where the rivers and plumes go. Um, there's one longer site which measures water quality year round, um, it's continuous, and then there's three pesticide sites down, not shown on this map, but they're down um, off the plain catchment. In terms of what do we measure, so a number of physical variables that tell us about um, the local conditions, water movement, um, and I guess freshwater influence in coastal waters. There's also biological variables, so chlorophyll and total sediments tell us about productivity and water clarity in particular. And then the chemical variables, so there's your suite of nutrients um, and the speciation of those as well as carbon that give us a bit more of a complex understanding of um, the dynamics in the marine system and how the, um, uh, I guess, the water quality um, is tracking in those areas. Um, how do we use the data? So the, this is for the 1920 water year, which you probably won't have seen these results before. Um, so the, we used straight out the water quality results for, like just to report against the um, status and condition of trend. Um, scoring relative to water quality guidelines. So Carl talked a little bit about guidelines before. Um, all of the parameters have a threshold value that we can to um, and we just uh, separate that between the dry and the wet season so whether or not we're exceeding guidelines at a particular site and then there's a water quality index which is used more as an interpretive tool for all of those parameters and that's rated on a score of very poor to very good um, here and that sort of reflected remember I showed the report card results so here in the very poor to poor condition um, quite a few of the parameters are sitting there in this region. Um, in terms of the results, so from 2019-20, so last wet season, um, there weren't many, or no current indicators for meeting those guideline values. Um, however, some of them were pretty close, which is a slight improvement to what we've seen before. And the, the ones that were exceeding the guidelines, um, I guess a majority of the indicators representing water clarity, nutrients, and productivity. When we look at the overall results for the whole GBA, you can see the differences. So quite important that there are very um, distinct regional differences and they're influenced by a number of factors, not only in the catchment, but the marine system as well. And you'll also see variability within a region. So, um, differences between sites can be quite significant, but here, as I showed in that report card result, um, it remains to be poor in the Macarvick Sunday region, and that's a um, combined water quality assessment. When you look at the trends over the last five years, um, so there's a couple of indicators which are improving, so phosphate and chlorophyll, which is a, is a good sign. Um, there's a, quite a few that are stable, so particularly the nutrient, other nutrient indicators and then also second depth and um, suspended sediment, so it's good that they're stable, they're not declining. And then there's no indicators that are getting worse here, which is good at the moment. Um, just showing here the example, these are the sorts of the outputs that you'd see in the um, report, so just highlighting there, um, showing those trends in time uh, against the guideline value over the full 15 year period. Um, when you look at the actual index, which is a combination of the different water quality parameters, um, the Macaiwick Sunday region unfortunately has seen a moderate decline um, since the beginning of the program, but it has stabilised in the last four years, um, which 
which is um, always a good story to be able to tell, although it's stabilised at four. I'm not sure if that's okay. Just wanted to touch on pesticides. So um, there are passive samples that are deployed in the wet season. They go out for a month at a time um, over the, that three-month period. They uh, they integrate results for 13 PS2 herbicides and 17 other pesticides, things like the imidacloprid and 2,4-D, and they're the same ones that are measured in the catchment program. Um, the sites here are Flat Top Island, Recos Bay and Sandy Creek, so they just sit at um, moorings just outside of those locations. Uh, in 1920, um, quite often throughout the sampling period of 15 years, the loggers or the passive samplers will go missing. Unfortunately, uh, last wet season we had them missing in a couple of the key months in two of the sites, so I would say that these results are a bit of an underestimate um, during those flush periods of mid December to mid January. Um, I guess on a positive note, though, there were no exceedances of the guideline values at those sites. Um, and the predominant pesticides are the same as they have been in the past. So diuron, atrazine and maxazenone. Uh, all the detections were below the guideline values. Uh, Durant's were protected of the 99% of species, which is good. Um, diuron was a little bit higher um, in a couple of the locations. So the risk of exposure when you look at the mixture of the pesticides, which is the same metric that they use at the end of catchment, it was low to very low in all locations. Um, but as I said, we missed those two months, um, those two periods in a couple of the locations, so I would say it's a potential underestimate. So just on terms of the water quality stuff, um, for 1920, the water quality was reported as being in um, poor condition. All of the indicators exceeded the guidelines. Um, some of them were getting closer to them though. Um, the five year trend suggests that they're decreasing or stable, which I guess is positive, and then the pesticides didn't exceed the first three sites that were monitored. I uh, just wanted to touch on this. This is a big component of the program, which I won't go into detail of them to say what we do with the data. So we combine the MODIS or Sentinel satellite imagery and you can use the colour of the water to characterise what the water quality conditions might be like, and that's validated using those measured results in the marine environment. So um, using that, you can straight out just look at that to have a look at the visual extent of um, the flood plumes during the uh, uh, wet season or during event conditions. Um, we characterise the water based on a weekly basis. So you can have a cross look across the whole wet season on, in a weekly basis where the water quality conditions are changing. You can also assess the exposure of um, risk to corals and seagrass, so that's one of the primary outputs in the marine monitoring program. So it really gives us a good indication of where the water's going and that likely composition across the whole Great Barrier Reef, um, validated by the monitoring data. And it also can show in some of those larger events, so the Macaulay Sunday region is often or not often, periodically, affected by the Fitzroy, for example. So that partly answers your question before about um, how come you might not a direct link between the adjacent catchment and the marine system offshore as the water tends to move north. So in those big events in the Fitzroy, we, we do see water coming up into this region, particularly the southern part and also into the wet Sundays. There's just some examples. I don't know if you can see, but it's just really quite compelling and a useful communication <coughs> tool. Here in 2011, the Whitsunday region, you can see that really greenish water extending um, to the, sort of that's the mid shelf and outer reefs there. Uh, so that's an indication of that high nutrient enrichment in the water and the phytoplankton. Um, here you see the vertican, that's a bit of a doozy in that year very dirty water um, and over time we saw the colour of that uh, water changing from that brownish to the greenish waters as the sediment starts to drop out and have more light for algae growth. Um, we can also do patterns in particular events, it's not that great to see on this screen but it, you can actually have daily images if you don't have that cloud cover. So the coral monitoring, so Angus has given me these slides. Um, because he's out sampling at the moment, doing the measurements for the region at um, 
for the year in the Macquarie Sunday region. As I said, the major disturbances um, in terms of uh, thermal stress in this region, particularly last year, but also 2016. Um, obviously, there was the big um, impact of Cyclone Debbie, and we're still seeing the effects of that in the coral reef and seagrass communities, <coughs> um, which is a few years ago now, so those effects have been long-lasting. The sites that are monitored here, um, shown in this part of the map, uh, but listed here. So it, it's largely located around the West Sundays, less so in the southern part of the region. So with, when you see in the report card the result, it's a coral index, which is a combination of a number of indicators um, to do with the coral cover, the juvenile presence of juvenile corals. So they're an indicator of um, overall health of the system the presence of macroalgae, so you'll start to get that shift as the system is declining, um, coral cover increase, and then community composition. If you look at the inshore results, this is um, from sampled in uh, February and March 2019, and then June last year. Um, you can see that the here's the different indicators uh, representing each one of these factors, but the overall score um, there, so I'm showing four over the last couple of years. And just highlighting here, um, trying to understand how um, the pattern over that time, so Cyclone and Louis happened around 2012, and you started to see that decline um, around that period. We actually started to see some really good recovery up until 2016, and the reefs in this region sort of got to a condition of what's rated as good, uh, and then Cyclone Debbie came. So we started to see the effect of that. Um, it's a bit of a delayed effect when it got down to four in 2019, because the reefs are only sampled every second year in some locations. So it is a response to Cyclone Debbie. Um, and then in 2020, it remained that way. So part of that is because of the bleaching. Um, they actually didn't see a worsening of condition as a result of the bleaching, but that's because I think the system's already quite uh, degraded. And you can see some examples here. This is Double Cone Island at the two metre site. So they've had a 97% in coral cover loss. So here's the site in 2015, 2017, and then 2020. So you've got a complete shift in the community at that location. And then also at the deeper site. You tend to see, I guess, to some extent, um, less influence on those deeper sites, but still quite significant in the change of the community over that time. So you get a lot more algae growing on those reefs once they lose that coral cover. Similar, another example at Daydream Island where it's got from a coral-based community into largely macroalgae. Seagrass. Uh, so Lynn McKenzie runs the program for James Cook University for across the whole Great Barrier Reef. Um, so they measure seagrass abundance reproductive effort as well as tissue nutrients. Um, there's 10 sites in this region, so they're uh, from, um, I guess, the list here, so the Whit Sundays all the way down to the um, southern, more southern part of the catchment in Serena Inlet. So it's a really important ecosystem in this region. Obviously, it provides important habitat for fisheries, but also food source and habitat for turtle and dugong, and that's the case across the whole Great Barrier Reef. There's 13 species of seagrass in the region. Um, there's good representation of a range of seagrass types. Um, and then we have, though, had a recorded history of moss in the region over time. The deep water seagrass meadows are poorly represented and there's very little known about those. So there's not a lot of targeted monitoring on deep water seagrass across, across the whole Great Barrier Reef. When you look at the status and condition across those 10, year lo um, 10 locations, so it's fluctuated since 1999, um, but it's generally got a, um, I guess, a, a declining trend and then we've seen significant losses over time. So 2010-11, was a major impact for seagrasses across the whole Great Barrier Reef as a result of those massive floods. Um, and they've taken, in some areas, a lot longer to recover than others. Um, in some
some areas they lost complete reproductive effort, so that means they're not producing any seed banks. Um, here, there is a seed bank still persisting, which is good because it shows that there is some capacity for reproduction. The leaf tissue nutrients indicate that there's um, nitrogen is quite um, high and, and is like an indicator of what's in the water column. Um, but it's also, so it shows that response to poor, moderate to poor water quality. Um, and the overall condition is um, poor and remains poor in the current year as well. So it's not a great story for seagrass. So when you have a look at that, um, I guess the team's concluded that there are really strong links to water quality and seagrass condition in the reef, particularly those large events, I mean in this region particularly, um, and those significant flood events. So it's uh, probably the most significant threat to seagrass. And they're mostly affected by light. So if you've got a lot of material in the water column, whether it be sediment or algae from those increased nutrients, that's when you'll start to see degradation of those systems. So overall, um, so this is looking across the last couple of years. Um, so the system does remain to be in relatively poor condition. Um, I should highlight this is what's measured at those monitoring sites and there probably possibly are patches in the region which aren't um, where we wouldn't say um, that it's you know, blanket poor everywhere. There's probably some patches of locations that have some reprieves from, the, from these conditions. But at the sites that are monitored um, for all of those parameters, it remains to be relatively poor. Um, there is a huge amount of information generated about the program. There's a couple of key sites there. So the Great Barrier Reef and Marine Park Authority is just putting in a lot of effort now to update the info, make it more accessible. So I encourage you to go to their site. Um, and then also the eAtlas um, has specific data for each of the program components, including study sites. Um, all of the reports are available online. So we do an annual technical report uh, for every component of the program. I don't know how many people read them, but they take a long time. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to thank uh, all the partners here. So as I said, I'm representing a whole bunch of people. Um, the program is funded by um, Australian Government and coordinated by the Great Barrier Marine Park Authority. Um, and we've also worked closely with the um, catchment team uh, with the NDC data, trying to link the two data sets together. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Any questions from the floor for Jane? I'll bring up our I'll I'll give some some extra slides in case you ask me more no. questions.
tissue, they'll expel the little animal part of it, so they'll, they'll look like they're bleached as well if they've been severely affected by um, pesticides. Fortunately, um, as, as Carl explained, a lot of the impacts that we see from pesticides in our system are sort of in the, the freshwater and the coastal and some inshore areas, so it's not like we're seeing pesticides going far offshore. They're certainly detected, but not at concentrations that are likely to impact um, corals and seagrass um, to the point of fatality. Um, are microplastics uh, being considered? No, they're not, but I identify that as a big gap as well. Um, it's certainly identified, I guess, in the reef um, community as one of the EPOP emerging threats, um, but no, it's not measured yet, and we have identified it as a gap. Um, you mentioned the seed bank for seagrasses. What period of viability for the seed bank? I actually don't know that answer. <laughs> um, I'd have to ask Lynn uh, to, and I can respond to that specifically. Um, I, I don't know how long. The, the, the good thing about seagrasses is, um, and I don't know if you're any familiar with any um, local sites, is they do come and go quite quickly, so they'll change quite rapidly to the environmental conditions, which means if you give them a chance to recover, they will recover quite quickly. Um, depends though how significant the impact was, and that's so something like that 2011 event, it's taken several years because they've been exposed to other disturbances as well, and the same with Cyclone Debbie. So they're taking a long time. With Debbie, because of the scale of that cyclone, not only do you have the light problem for a long period of time, so several weeks, but also they were actually tuned up. So they, they lose their, their stability and their base to recolonize. Uh, is that it? Oh, passive samplers. How do passive samplers work for pesticides? Um, so the, I don't know if you've ever seen, oh, they were in my, one of my slides, there's a picture there. So there's two different types, one for polar and one for non-polar pesticides, and they've got a little membrane in them. And so it's an integrated result, so it accumulates those chemicals over time for the period of deployment. So you, you need to have a specific sampler for the period of time you're putting out, um, to enable so that it can integrate those results over time. So what you will measure in that is a peak, um, and it's not like taking a grab sample where you can just say the concentration on this day is this time. It will give you an integrated result over the period that you deploy it. So it will give you some indication of here was the peak in that wet season, one month period, or dry season, whenever you do it. Um, so that's how they work. They have different types for different pesticides, and then they can the different um, uh, chemicals present in that film. Uh, have there been any have there been any major trends across the program's 15 years that are surprising or significant? Um, I guess uh, when we started the program, I don't think we ever envisaged having the major bleaching events that we've had to the scale that we've had. Um, so to me, the positive outcomes of the program is when we have had those periods where there has been some reprieve in other disturbances, you do see some recovery. Um, I guess that uh, by now in a long-term program, we know that it takes a long time to detect improvements from a catchment-based input in the marine system. And so we're not surprised that that's still a very complicated and challenging um, relationship to disentangle um, and you imagine with you know you might we expect to see uh, changes in the catchment and eventually we'd like to be able to measure that in the reef um, but there's so many other factors influencing that but we do start to see those trends and there's some areas where we're actually seeing improvements which I think is a fantastic message but it does take long term so there haven't been any particular surprises just some I guess um, yeah, positive aspects of recovery when you give it the chance. Uh, is that probably the main things? Particularly covered it. You talked about the change in salinity. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Okay. All right, any other questions for Joe before we close this particular session? Um, so I'll ask Len about the seed banks and yeah, any other specific questions just um, send through and I can ask the others as well. Fantastic. Thank you, Jane. Thanks very much.
much for that. All right, I believe it is Sandy Craig time. Is that right? Yes. So we have Adam from Pharmacist. It's coming on up. assessment we looked at their nozzles we upgraded the nozzles to the nozzles that did the right job we looked at their nozzle bodies to make sure that they could change their nozzles to do the job they needed to when they needed to do it um, the metaclopid applicators we looked at flow view meters so they knew that the application was being done properly at the time and weather meters to ensure that they had the record that was required so this is one of the growers, he had a very basic boom, normal spacing to the standard 50 centimetres. Didn't suit his row spacing. So with the funding that was supplied, he spent nearly twice as much again and rebuilt his boom. What we supplied was some nozzles and some nozzle bodies to help him actually get the job done properly with the perfect overlap every time he did a pass. We went through with the growers to try and get them with their records and everything up to date. So making sure that they had the blocks, paddocks, application rates right, make sure they had their delta T through delta T charts or through weather meters. Now, I've had many questions in the nine months I've been the pharmacist. Where do I stand against other growers? Do I put more chemical on than others? Do I put less on? Am I using good level, good rates, bad rates? So with this program, we've managed to start to benchmark what, we're, what growers are doing against others. Not all growers like that, but if they ask, we can answer that question. And I'll pass over there, Mike. Thank you, Adam. So what are the results from all the fantastic work that Pharmacist and Adam's team has been doing? Um, basically, over the three year period of the project, we've just been taking a bunch of water samples. Um, primarily, this has been achieved through an auto sampler that we have just in North Etton at the end of the Brightly Patch sub pattern. Um, and you can see that there just next to the white view. Uh, so, this auto sampler is programmed to um, sample, um, take water samples at specific river heights um, as the River falls and rises in response to heavy rain periods. Um, we're also very fortunate to have a whole bunch of growers on board with us um, going out during these heavy rain periods and taking their own water samples just to give themselves a bit of a better understanding of how their farm 
just specifically what the floor um, has like restrictions are from their farm and farms upstream, um, just for their own peace of mind and to figure out what, what they're actually doing with their chemicals. Um, and here we also have a pretty picture of the headwaters of Sandy Creek as well.
obviously dependent on a whole range of different factors. Um, each wet season is very different, so we really need to keep in mind um, how much precipitation there was, what the exact stream volumes coming down Sandy Creek, um, the antecedent conditions of the subcatchment, so what was the dry season like, were there any other kind of factors that influenced the growers, you know, that were out of their control, such as seasonality, that influenced when they applied their chemicals. The timing of the sampling, so could we actually get out to these first flush events, could we access them, or oh, was the road cut off due to floods? Um, and it could be interesting also to just compare this catchment, the results from this catchment, with other catchments. So we're processing um, data from, San, uh, from James Creek at the moment. Um, could be interesting to have a look at that. And so what's next for the Sandy Creek project? Um, we're in the process for applying funding to keep the water sample where it is and keep water sampling. Um, and we're also looking to really try and target the limited flow produce um, and help farmers understand um, their application methods they can use. Uh, so we're interested if you're interested. Uh, and thanks for listening. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Adam. So any questions from the floor about this one? Or any um, slides that people want to go back and revisit? program but I looking at your results and the the improvements that we are seeing in the marine passive samplers that would be useful to uh, for us to look across those data sets formally because um, pesticides is obviously one of the main things that you can actually detect that difference and link it back to a catchment change the dynamics of sediments and nutrients are so tricky but pesticides you would expect to see that change quite quickly in the marine system so it'd be great to I don't know who, I mean, our, in, in the marine monitoring program, maybe someone's already spoken to you about that, but if they have enough, follow up. Absolutely, great. Thanks, Jen. Any other questions, comments about this one? Any slow typists, feel free to speak now. We won't judge you. Do <laughs> a question, Ken. We've got a, what we call a monitoring catchment at North Eden. Oh, we call it old farm, it's 3,000 hectares of cane catchment, 10 years of nutrient pesticide data, which would be a good comparison for you. That's great. I think I do have that for the, the 18 to 19 data, but it would be good to get a yeah, data of the version of it. I was originally part of the Sandy Creek Hotspot program. Great. Yeah. Awesome. I've got a question if no one else has. So you would have both been involved in other sort of water quality projects, so how do you feel this one is different from sort of other things that you've done before? Do you see any sort of differences? Oh, I can't comment, sorry. I've hmm. yeah. been in the role for about five months, but oh, okay. I don't know if you've got any... <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Adam? Um, I'm sort of new to this, so you know, I've, yeah. I've only been in the role for nine months. Um, yeah. Previously, I farmed for 23 years, so, oh, that's yeah, yeah. so it's sort of, it's yeah. sort of first round of this sort of thing I've had a go at. Yeah, right. So, yeah, no, I can't really yeah. comment on it. Yeah, so I'll come and ask you in another year or so. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Yeah, that's good. Looks like you've got a question over here for that. Uh, regarding growers wanting to make a practice change, um, I've probably encountered, with the current Blue Water 2 project, which is a follow-on from the Sandy Creek project, probably at least 80% of growers are lacking knowledge having a knowledge gap of not knowing what they are or aren't doing. So there's a lot of growers asking questions because they don't actually know um, what is right. Um, we all hear stories as growers on that someone's in trouble for doing something wrong. But the biggest thing is is because they have never been told. A lot of growers I've spoken to have always been told um, a chemical will control something, a chemical could do something. They've never been told where they can't use it or what they can't with it. So um, there seems to be a big knowledge gap there um, in the reseller market of them not being told that it'll control a certain weed but you can't spray it here. 
before you can't spray it at this time of year or under these weather conditions. There's been changes in the legislation that make that a little bit more complicated to go with it. But generally overall, <coughs> I've had a pretty positive um, feedback from growers just wanting to know what's right and what's wrong. Does that answer the question? Second one. Uh, well, it sort of is actually measured as a controlled waterway because we can determine what products are applied in that catchment. So, if we can determine what gets applied prior to the program and what's applied during the program, we can determine what actual load of pesticides been applied through a three year um, period. So we'll have the results within about two more days of the actual applied data, applied and active ingredients. So we will actually be able to determine what was applied in that waterway, in that catchment zone, to deem it as a, what you want to call it as best you can, a controlled waterway. Um, and that can then reference some of our um, sample data back to the home bush sample up and downstream if there was any questions about those results. Any other questions? Good start. Thank you. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I stand between you and that door. I'm the last one standing. I'm not sure if the uh, speakers are coming or going in this slide. I'm thinking that I'm coming behind Adam, a tough act to follow. But I'm here to give you just another story, and I'm going to do it quite differently to the previous presentation. You will not see water quality data, mostly because at this stage it's been collated and has yet to be presented to the group of growers in James Creek. Once it's available then, I'm quite sure it will be willingly shared. So I'll take you on the journey instead. Uh, it started in April 2018. It could have started earlier, but the application was unsuccessful. But after us sluggish start, we did get going, and I always try and point out that the funding is from the Department of Environment Science. When working with growers, it's important to do this because they're usually associated more with the regulatory side of things, and a recent court case as well. The project was managed by Reef Catchers, and they approached Mackay Area Product Services to do the work with the cane farmers, and because my area is a Farley area, and that's where James Creek is. Um, that's how I fit it into the picture. So just to give you a bit of an idea of where James Creek catchment is, I'll go into a little bit more detail because right where we are here, the water from James Creek is just there, going right past, on the way to the Goose Ponds. Actually, I'm going to abandon this laser pointer and go for my own. There's we are. And one of the things we learned early in the piece is that this is entirely, well it was, placed by a farmer. He got a bit annoyed how once the water came down it just spread all the way in a fairly haphazard manner. So about 80 years ago he went along with the plough and he just followed his fence line. Oh, there's a turn. Fence line. The water followed it, and that became James Creek. The catchment itself is up here. Bruce Highway. You'll notice a fair bit of roadworks going on there. James Creek crosses under Bruce Highway. 
James Peak also got shifted north by main roads, all the pyramids in place, into this canyonland here, about 80 metres or so. Keep your eye on that, this is some spectacular engineering work yet to be tested. Catchment boundaries, I love them. All squiggles. So this is Bruce Highway, just uh, from the earliest line, where Main Roads has done their work. And generally it follows on up into the catchment here. There's another branch coming on down. We also treat that as James Creek. Can cause confusion. Um, still getting you oriented. Bali Town, Bali Mill. Uh, Queensland Rail comes on through on its way to the harbour. This is where it crossed James Creek. Might refer to that a little bit later in the presentation. It uh, in 2008 it actually became a dam and contributed to the flooding in February. Busy little road this one since the Mackay Bypass. Um, this is Holtz Road, pops out near Bains. So I think you've all been preparing, so I'll just point out uh, these bare patches are extraction pits or quarries. There's another one there. And you can see a scattering of dwellings. So there's, well, what's called rural residential, da -da -da -da, and uh, urban. Yeah, that'll do. Some stats. All right, how big is it? Not very big at all. <laughs> it's quite small. In fact, when we first talked about it as a project, we kind of thought maybe is it possible to be too small? Sure, that figure changes a bit. That's just the geography of the catchment. It's actually a lot more in terms of land being managed by the landholders because they own other properties outside that boundary and. Some of the properties go over the top of that boundary. Number of sugar cane growers, there were 10. Nine participated in the project, which is not a bad strike rate. Number of cane farms, 13. I'll point out that when we started, there's a bit more area under cane than there is now. There's cane land going out and causes concern in certain areas. Thank you. Um, it's it's not a steady decline, uh, but generally it goes from cane to grazing. And while this figure might be in some dispute, maybe, uh, basically there's one extra grazing interest there than there was at the start. Uh, urban or rural residential footprint, 8%, and a bit of area for the quarries. All right, when you write a project, you've got to talk about what you're going to achieve. So to work with all rural land managers and contractors, and we're talking mostly about harvesting contractors there, to improve practices, demonstrate a water treatment solution, and monitor water quality. As it turned out, all of those were very achievable. So the activities, this is a regular communication events. Uh, all credit has to go to new catchments. I just supply some data, uh, organise the guys to turn up at sheds for a bit of a talk. Field walks are always good. Uh, there's also a website, but I think I won't be the only one visiting it. The flood modelling was done by a contractor, um, and an order sampler was set up um, pretty much back in the middle of the catchment. And also, growers were invited to participate and do grab samples and contribute those samples for analysis. And we had two growers put themselves forward, and really they put in a top effort. You know what it's like, get rid of a bed, and it starts to rain. <laughs> so you're down there at 10 o'clock doing a grab sample. Well, actually, it wasn't him, it was his wife. <laughs> All right, what did I have to do to earn my money? Uh, I had to do the benchmarking. So initial, and at the end, start and close. 
And also, we had the gear to measure cane losses from harvesters. And that was done for all contractors working in James Creek. Grants. Now you've got their attention. Up to $8,000 was available for changes on farms. And if you happen to be a farmer who also was a harvesting contractor, you had another bite in it. So you could get two lots of eight grand. Now when you're talking harvesters, eight grand doesn't go very far. And all the applicants, applications that were successful for the harvesters, it went up to that figure, 8,000. But I have to say for those who had a focus on their farming equipment, such as fertilizer gear, spray rigs, uh, pompadour applicators, generally they didn't get anywhere near there, so it uh, was a spend of about half that amount. Continuing on the project activities, a social survey was done. Now I heard about this, and I was not really that thrilled about it. Well, I'm a convert. I think it was great. Tracy Schultz came out, DES. She's no longer with them, I believe. She's uh, gone on to Green Pastures. But she demonstrated how, in a very informal way, she could get a handle on what growers were thinking and their thoughts. <laughs> now, I actually started doing a whole lot of bullet points here. I gave up. I'll put some pictures in instead. So, it felt a bit under pressure. Though, reluctant to commit themselves to anything, in case they paint themselves into a corner. And we're all in search of truth. As scientists, we call it data, or building blocks of truth. But the gross perspective is sometimes they're wondering what they'll find and how it will affect them. Is seeing the truth. And what Tracy also got was a whole bunch of really great little quotes, and here's one. It is better to be seen as part of the solution than to be seen as part of the problem. I suspect it wasn't original, but it was heartfelt. What also came out of it was stories, the connection that they had to the land, uh, that they've been farming for decades, generations, and uh, stories about how he and his brother took the truck they shouldn't have and it ended up in James Creek, in a water hole, where you could only see the roof. Now you could actually pretty much drive down James Creek. Now there's no water holes that you could even bury a topatory in. It's uh, changed that much. And I guess what I should have done a little earlier is highlight that James Creek is a highly modified system. You could use the word degraded if you wish. People remember the way it was. And they kind of wanted to return it to that time. So let's focus on what came out of it. Well, the average nitrogen rates were reduced. I don't know if you can read that or not, it's a terrible green, but in plant it went down from an average of 156 to 131. Here was anything. In returns, quite a drop as well too. The little note at the bottom is saying, look, it's not all because of this project. We can't take credit for everything, especially if it's gone wrong. But with this change here, there's a lot going on as well. It's um, Oh, well, it's about being audited for your fertiliser. The growers were very aware of that, and some were going through the process. There's also a greater awareness of fertiliser rates, and they were asking, not just myself, but others, how they should do it right. Now, I want to pick on the, up on that uh, point from Adam, that they're being shown that they really need to pull back, and then they're helped to do so. Can't mention nitrogen without phosphorus, but it's a little bit less um, clean cut. At the beginning, it was pretty much how it is now, unfortunately. About 40% of the area, there is per recommendations, about 40% of the area have exceedances happening for all sorts of reasons. And the remaining 20%, well, they're actually putting on less P than they should. And they're kind of cashing in a bit on a history of mill mud. Well, as you might have noticed, it's pretty close to the Farley Mill. And there were times those blocks were getting 
quite a tough recipe. Herbicides are now being applied right through the pantry with the correct spray nozzles and water rates because we also found uh, that they were very keen to uh, invest with grants in these multi-nozzle bodies. Uh, there isn't a single brick that doesn't have those on it now. With that, this comes a lot better awareness then of using the product, particularly pre-emergence versus knockdowns. Still going, uh, the growers identified that their choices of the herbicides had shifted. Before it was just on cost and doing the job. And now they are really very aware of the potential of the product to move off their farms, even though they won't. I'd heard about how chemicals can travel in water, but now I have seen how quick it can be. A bit more detail, I suppose. This diuron applied as a spot spray, rained a couple days later, boom, there you are the same thing. Quite a distance away. Uh, jewel in the crown of the project, and it was there in the beginning, if you might remember, was to put in a a uh, bit of treatment works, water treatment works, and this is it. We've got the jewel in the ground, it's a bit of a focus point anyway. Previously the grower had dug a hole, thought it was big enough, and that was it. So with a bit of design from the reef catchment scheme, um, and money, what we have here is the intake from the right hand side, um, stone wall, this is a, a middle pond, another stone wall, pond on the other side, and now flowing. And you can see those um, trees are coming along all right too around it. That has been a focus of quite a few field walks. I think I'm most heartened to hear growers when they find out how much is spent on it, be quietly confident that they could do it for a fraction of that price. <laughs> And now I would like to see them do it. They can see that it's not necessarily taking a large chunk of cane land. It can complement what's there already. And um, there's a pride. There's a pride in it. Uh, the landholder that this is on, he takes his grandkids down there. And they fish for tilapia. Or <laughs> well, they're there. <laughs> All right, um, look, the project actually got extended. By not quite sure how or why, but it's a good idea. And they asked for three demo sites. And the demo sites, um, well, partly it was our ideas, but it's also partly what growers wanted to know more about. So, one demo site, Milma, applied as a band on the cane row versus no Milma. Uh, this is a little unit to collect the sample, with, uh, a water sample from the inter row. Uh, Milmut's not normally this colour, <laughs> but it was growing a very, very impressive fungus. Um, this is not how we generally like to see Milmut being used. We like to see it applied to a fellow who worked in. That's the, that's the ultimate. But farming is compromises. And this is compromise. Putting it on the cane row. About 75 tonnes to the hectare. So, we'll get data about that. The other Second demo site was about pre-emergent herbicide. Boom versus band. It was flame, which popped up in Adam's presentation. Can move, the active. Um, and logic dictates if you're putting on less, there should be less in the water. And the data is yet to be uh, seen to find out whether it, um, whether it does follow logic. And lastly, legend value versus band. This project happened to dovetail at a time when Max acquired a zero-till leg implanter. It's a beauty. Double discs cutting through the cane trash into the old cane row. You can see the cane returning away there. It's doomed, it's gonna get sprayed and killed. Um, but behind those double discs, the seed is dropped in, soybean, and press wheels close it up. That's Dave McCallum. Um, wherever the machine went, he went. And uh, because it's new machinery, it does need a little bit of time to settle in, but six sites in total had this machine visit in the weeks before Christmas, and it was quite hectic. 
all six sites had a really good result. This is actually a photo taken by one of the participants in the group on your camera. Can you see some there, Jacob? Um, at the far end of that block, it's even more impressive because near Shubbershed Road, water was in the interspace. And normally that would be the death of any soybean planted. But here, planted on the slightly raised old Cane Road, the soybean had a chance and it took it. It grew well 12 weeks after planting there. Also, it dovetailed with the program of training growers to be able to use some software that MAPS has made available to them for free of charge. And we focused on the participants in Jane's Print to just show them a different way of keeping records, a digital way. So this is another farm, and farm just in Jane's Print. There's uh, Farley Hill, got your bearings. Um, it's a spatial representation of the data you put in through these magic buttons. It can be overwhelming for farmers. Um, but after this workshop, well, they're no longer overwhelmed, but um, I think they're going to need a bit more of a prod in the ribs to keep using it. Record keeping is not high on their list of things. But it's a terrific little bit of software. And in using it, I hope they'll come to say the same thing too. Now, Expectations. <clears throat> Participants at the outset, while they might have been a little bit suspicious of larger agendas, they all focused in cleaning out Jeans Creek. I alluded to that before. Get in there and get those water holes back so you can have a swim in them. No can do. I mean, there's rules against that. And while they're disappointed, they accepted it. Uh, some of them felt that all that was needed is earthworks, silt traps, heavy banks, drains, bank stabilisation work, and that's true to a point. But in a little while, they came around to seeing that management within the cane block actually carried a little bit more weight, and that's where it went. Everyone has a moment about the sugar price. Uh, they did want some involvement from the rural residential or the urban sectors. That's too hard. Honestly, can you could be like herding cats. No one group sort of represents them. Um, they probably don't really care, they just kind of live there. And um, even if the results were available, I don't think they'd even read it. So our focus was definitely on the landholders. I mentioned about the railway line having a role to play in the floods of February 2008. Well, no, we can't get the engineers there to replace those inadequate culverts with something that's a little bit better. So, what I liked is that in the project, growers accepted the boundaries. What we can do, what's achievable, and what's kind of not. Measures of success. I think one of them is that other growers have seen what's going on. And they've approached me and others requesting a similar project be done in their catchment. It's out there. Growers who said it was just a drain now value it more as a water course. And ownership grew. <laughs> There's a spoiler. Theft of the auto sampler. Before, after. You know what they left? The foundations. Fortunately, the thieves were considerate to wait until we got most of the data. All right, quick summary. The catchment approach is not new, but it's a good model, well worth persevering with. Each catchment case will be different. James Creek's different to Sandy Creek, and the future ones will be different again. There's no such thing as too small. I guess it's possible to be too big. Time will tell. A project lasting three years can bring about measurable change. That was one of my doubts. Three years? Well, you're kidding me. What are you going to get done in three years? Actually, we got quite a lot. A lot happened in that three years. And there's going to be ongoing work. The project officially is drawing to a close, but there's more work to be done. There's a presentation of the data I alluded to earlier. That's got to be presented back to the growers. A narrative from that data needs to be built. It's not just numbers, it's got to be telling them a story. 
What's it going up? Is it going down? Are you guys doing fine? Or are you really worth crucifying? The objectives were not only ambitious and largely achieved. A success story. The landholders, once on board, made it the success story. And the importance of incentives cannot be overstated. I could underline that one if you like. And then efforts to capture the qualitative, for example, the social survey are to be supported. And a suggestion that came up from geni some genius on Friday, Peter, a closing social survey would be a really good idea. You and I can do it. All right. Have I left you stunned? Are you ready to get home? Fire a question. Don't use that other system. <laughs> start something, know what you're going to use. Ah, then change it in the middle. Uh, the other one is that um, a lot of interest in what happens to the water as it comes on into the goose ponds. And the water has been sent into the goose ponds, but it started 18 months later. So there was that hiatus. It didn't have one project starting at the same time as the other. So uh, towards the end of the project, the growers are being shared, have seen the starter. Um, again, not quite sure what it means, but it is very much about, yes, we're very close to an urban environment. How does the water quality change as the water travels through an urban environment? And there's some outstanding things there, which I won't go into at the moment. Um, I think one of the other things that probably could have been done better, and we might actually do it this time, uh, when we present the data to the growers. Not set it up as a seminar, but have it as a drop-in centre. As a seminar, we didn't really get that great inter interaction. I know growers left with questions, but they didn't ask them. And I'm thinking that when it comes time for us to share the data, we'll do it, maybe get that uh, chain of ponds, that treatment train I showed you, set up a pergola there, have some people there, and some, some sort of other incentive to turn up, like some <coughs> cold ones in an esky, and then one-to-one -one that way. So I think we can do that better. Um, aside from that, I do feel for the growers as they look at their poor old Jane's Creek, and they do see it as just a relic of the creek it used to be. And I know the law says, don't put an excavator in there. By golly, it could do some good in the hands of a skilled operator. So I'll leave it there. <laughs> Does that answer your question, Kevin? Thank you. <laughs> Someone else? Yeah. I did put my question in the right. Oh, did you? Oh, well done. Ten points to you. The social survey. My question was: Should it be done? Is it best done by the local person um, among their people that they know? Or is it better to bring bring um, a, um, outside professional in to do it? And um, what is the best way of building up the rapport and the support to, to do it? Because it's always a sensitive issue. In uh, this case, uh, the better part of the data, the exercise was carried out by um, Tracy Schulz. And she did an exceptional job. But she didn't get everyone. 
and the other ones were left to me. And I wasn't a patch on her. But I tried to summarise what I learned from those surveys. I didn't have the same style, of course, but I avoided reading through questions at the table. It was more of a conversation. And then I had to try and report that back to her. And then she put it all together. So to answer your question, one person should do it. Whether it's the person on the spot or the expert that's brought in. Uh, the way it was, it was split down the middle roughly. She did it and did it far better than I did. Uh, so social surveys are a, a skill that not all of us have. Um, it can be acquired with time, but I didn't have enough time, I don't think. Trust, you know, trust was won quickly by Tracy. In fact, um, she was sitting there with a grower and she, the grower said, uh, you're related to such and such after working out there. She said, no, I'm not. He said, yes, you are. <laughs> and he was right. <laughs> but those stories that came out too, you know, they weren't recorded anyway. I really enjoyed those stories, those that the growers all put forward, uh, demonstrating their links and ties to it. Their childhood memories, the times when they got into trouble for losing the truck. The stories about why they didn't slash that paddock because there were water birds uh, nesting there. Um, then they go down and check the nest is empty and then go ahead and slash. And years later, they said, you know, they don't nest there anymore. The goannas have moved in. And so they're. they're you can't beat growers for being people who observe, and you can tap into that. Good question. His own. <laughs> this side, Mandy. You want to correct me on something? Mandy did the graziers, did an excellent job. Rounded them up. Still up there herding, herding cats. <laughs> You got a few stayers, got great work in fencing, uh, livestock crossings, watering points. Could you hear that at the back? Right, I'll hand over the mic. Right? Could you? <laughs> differentiated what a grazier was to take part in the project was the same way that we determined whether they are available, uh, able to access funding for other projects. So if they were a grazier um, when it came to the, the tax purposes, if they were earning over 20000 a year from their grazing enterprise, um, then they were considered to be able to take part in James Creek. So there's probably a lot of other five, ten acre blocks out there that people had come on, but the, the, the five and six were the ones that had probably a, an enterprise large enough to be considered a grazing enterprise. Um, so with, with one of those landholders, he actually um, concreted crossings for his cattle through drains um, on his property that were eroding and creating point sources of sediment, um, eventually going into James Creek. Uh, another grazier, there was a, a rural residential um, development next to his property. Um, they put up a lovely wall on the other side of the boundary that diverted all the runoff from that area straight through the middle of his paddock, um, which then created erosion issues. So he actually put um, a small separate basin in there to capture that to allow for um, siltation to occur before it then went into James Creek. Um, uh, other activities for things like upstream watering points. Um, the cost of, of undertaking riparian fencing starts at around about, or well, any fencing starts at about $10,000 per kilometre. So uh, a lot of the landholders took advantage of that $8,000 to actually install upstream watering points 
with um, them considering in the future to then put um, more fencing in as funding became available. So it was a, sort of a two-step process. It, it, for small areas like that, it is a large investment in capital for them to undertake those activities. Um, but I, I think the, the, for, for me, from my point of view, trying to integrate the different industries and keep them involved in the project as one was difficult. Um, trying to get the graziers and the cane farmers and everyone there and keep it relevant to everyone was, was a bit of a challenge. Um, but we got really good attendance um, and all through the process people were very keen the whole way through and I think it worked really, really well. Mandy, and yes, you're right. I think it worked very well. I can add some more information about the harvesting contractors, but when they spend the money perhaps, it's always at the back end of the machine. That's where sugar loss happens. So there's money on the primary extractors, the secondary extractors, the choppers, um, elevator floors, those sorts of things. It swallows up eight grand very quickly. But it did have measurable improvements in terms of sugar loss during the harvesting operation. <laughs> Were the primary operators involved? Um, you know, they, they turned up. They appeared at the start, the group meeting, uh, saying, here's the project, this is what we're trying to achieve. I think they turned up just to make sure that they weren't going to be in trouble. Um, because they didn't show up anymore. They were quite... Uh, <coughs> reassured, I suppose, that this is a project focusing on land management in an agricultural context. But they kept an ear out, I know, that they uh, just, they, they have been very aware of particularly the um, material that can be carried by water from their operations. In fact, uh, there's one story there of a road really disappearing under material um, after a particularly heavy event near my boss's house. And uh, since then, they put in measures that, prior to the project anyway, were more than adequate. We, they were always welcome, um, never really excluded, uh, and they're certainly there at the start, and they made their decision that, no, it doesn't need to uh, have dedicated time from there. Good question. Uh, changes in production over three years, um, we, well, all you do is you, you endeavour to maintain it. And in fact, over that three years, we actually saw production on some farms go backwards. But it wasn't because of the reduction of nitrogen, you know, it was the dry run years. Um, so we looked at production, but we didn't measure it, if you know what I mean. It wasn't part of the things we're seeking to change. We just simply wanted to maintain it and improve it where we can. I don't know if that answers the question, though. That's a bad one there, Don. <laughs> uh, you did notice, though, that the area under cane production is reducing and it will reduce further. Uh, as you go along Bruce Highway, you might see some fresh earthworks where there once was cane. That's going to be a motorcycle track, apparently. Um, you mentioned that poor old James Creek has had a bit of a death by a thousand cuts. There's been a lot of historical stuff. There's roads, there's rail, there's urban. Um, was there a feel amongst the landholders of what was the biggest <coughs> issue or impact on the creek? And um, who did they feel was responsible for addressing these, the issues? Well, no one's going to pay for it. <laughs> so yes, I'd be very happy for funds to come to James Creek specifically to try and restore some of the capacity in it. They would stand to gain by that too because it doesn't take much rain to make a flood. To break out of those little banks now and uh, go across the, the flatter country. A lot of them knew the creek very well. They knew very well. That's why the works by Main Roads Department at the bottom, they have seen James Creek angry, full joggers, 
carrying trees. And here's the works going on where not only runs parallel to the Bruce Highway, then it does a right hand turn. So that would be very interesting in a big event. I, I think they feel they've done a good job, but it's going to be tested. But to get back to your first question, uh, which I understand was the, the causes of James Creek becoming the way it is. Or what do they feel is the biggest issue? Yeah. It's, well, first they would say the biggest issue is carrying the water. Yeah. Yeah. Second would be that what vegetation is there being protected by the laws of the land probably isn't worth protecting. It's an uh, invasive species, it's palms that follow in when trees are gone. Uh, there's little clumps that you can work around, but the rest of it, you can start from scratch almost. But again, no one's going to do that just out of altruism. It costs a lot of money. My observation would be back in the period when people burnt, um, if you get, well, you don't even have to have a fire to get away, you've just got to have a strong gust at the wrong time, and if you get a canopy scorched, um, that potentially provides an opportunity for sunlight to get down and in those waterways, you can then get paragraphs moving in. So the next time there is a fire, you've got this big biomass and the burn event is even greater. So if you've got those burn events happening at a frequency greater than your recovery of your tree canopy, you end up with no trees. Yes. <laughs> Honestly, it is a highly modified landscape, degraded in places. I will point out that that little branch that came down to James Creek, anyone notice how straight it was? Every meander kink had to be taken out of it. So there's energy to be dealt with. And then those landholders had an issue. That energy ate away at the banks. So they rock pitched every bit of that long stretch of the creek. More work to be done actually. They've done the corners, they've done pretty good, but it's still straight. Oh, and council puts in a road, and the culverts don't line up. So the water had to come down, jink to the east, and then go under the road, then jink to the west. And that was pretty interesting as well, too. Just another one back on the tree. Sorry. Prior to effective cane grub control, there was actually a process where uh, because cane grub distribution and egg laying can be associated with the height of vegetation, there was actually a, a policy to remove trees as a mechanism to try and uh, incorrectly uh, manage the cane, cane grub. So possibly a lot of the creeks could have been cleared for that as well, historically. Uh, we'll probably look for maybe one or two more and then we'll look to wrap up. Very keen to hear this question. <laughs> I just I wanted to say thank you for a great presentation and it sounds like the project's been really successful. I guess there seem to be quite a few gems in what you've learned, um, both good and bad, of what to do again and maybe what to avoid. And I reckon one of the things that we're maybe not so good at in the reef space is capturing those and ensuring that they're carried into other programs and projects. So I was keen to know whether or not there's a plan process for that because there's an enormous amount of interest in water quality monitoring as a tool for engagement and facilitating practice change and I, I would say we probably haven't nailed exactly how to do that successfully yet so any bit we can learn about that's going to help. So just encouraging you to capture your key learnings and share them. You want me to write a report? Uh, no. I do. No, yeah, I'm sure you have to. <coughs> but really interested in your three pages of, you know, what are the key things that you do again or not? Yeah, sure. I've learned things, the growers have learned things. In fact, one of the legacies of the project is those growers, maybe they don't realise it, but they've come a long way. I'm very proud of them. And now they're not quite so frightened of seeing the truth. Not so wide-eyed after it, uh, but I still think they would have had some things in this room this morning that would have got them going. Yeah. So, is that a conversation that kind of needs to happen afterwards in terms of where to go from here? Like, say that peer review paper or the report? Sorry, the R word. Is that something that needs to to be followed up later? Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. I guess I'm not an investor, but I might be. But yeah. <laughs> um, just yeah, just um, I guess. I'm 
involved in the Great Bay Reef Foundation Working Group and there's, um, as I said, quite a lot of interest in getting these sorts of programs going. So having that feedback to ensure that that's translated into other projects. So yeah, I can talk with you directly, but um, that, and that would be helpful. Yeah. I saw some hand signals from Peter. Yeah, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> that's Peter's job as well. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be tied up in the report of the Jones Creek extension. Yeah. Yeah, so I think I've made a rod from my back too. <laughs> but I appreciate what you say and thank you. Awesome. Any, other, any final comments or questions for Stephen before he takes off? Great job, Stephen. Well done, Stephen. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. All right, everyone. We've made it to the end of the day. Goodness me. So, um, We've got some um, questions here for you because we appreciate that everyone's really busy. You've obviously all taken a day you know, of your time to come here. So very keen to hear what you thought of today. Did you get what you wanted out of it? I'll try to walk in front of the screen. I wonder. So we've got some, some great um, great feedback there. So most people feel that yeah they agree, they got all they wanted, they have a better understanding of Paddock to Reef and you know P2Rs has made some good progress over time. So that's um that's interesting feedback there. Has anyone got any um, I guess questions or not questions but comments? Um, would they like to expand on why they gave that particular score or if there's something they would have liked to have seen that might have bumped their score up a little bit higher? You know, any sort of um, comments people want to make or feedback they'd like to share uh, with all this. So sorry, just for anyone who didn't catch that, Peter was saying that the good news stories, he was very keen um, for that to come out of today and there's obviously been a lot of information, so, so that's great. Okay. I bet. Sorry. Yeah, I think one of the overriding questions this morning was for better understanding of paddock to reef or perhaps paddock to reef projector. Mm. I still think there's some more understanding of the mechanics of the projector would uh, be helpful, more yeah. information. It's a question that I've often put to Adam okay. before, but um, I think it would help, for, especially for those that are at the coal place. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you for that. So that was a comment regarding um, more information about the mechanics behind the projector tool. So I'll make a note of that up here. Okay. So that's very helpful feedback. Thanks everyone. We'll be using that to, to inform future um, forums. And what would improve your confidence in Paddock to Reef?
So people have asked for, I guess, more transparency in the data and more info about the, the assumptions in, in the background. Understanding the final objectives for paddock to roof. That's interesting. Consistency between models. Uh, again, more transparent data. Background papers that support input to the model. So there's kind of this thing coming through of having a bit more information about um, what's happening in the background, understanding where you know, the, the data is coming from. Sharing the good news story. So I think we've made a good start on that today, but yeah, there's always, as we've heard, there's always more we can be doing there, so that's excellent. More case studies. Sharing information on priority spots, transparency. So again, that's a very common thing that's coming through. And yeah, consistent approach to conducting the survey. Less ambiguous questions. And the whole system approach taken today is helpful and has helped. And yeah, I would agree with that. Just watching that as a facilitator, being able to see everyone kind of put their two cents in has been really good, not just the speakers, but also um, folks here today as well. Okay, well that's great feedback. Thanks everyone. Does anyone have anything they'd like to add to what's up there? A bit of frustration on the fact that um, the acknowledgement by Adam that the whole story wasn't wasn't being told, like the state of play today, um, where we're at, is not being um, passed on to the powers that be, and the, the industry still getting smacked over the head over the of where we're perceived to be. If you don't, if you understand what I mean. You know you're saying that the practices that we the E grade practices and I, we're not there, we're a part of that. Is that what have I got that right? The the grading that's in the report card is a reflection of the data that's fed into the yeah. report. So there's there's a lot of stuff there's a lot of stuff that happens outside of funded projects that we kind of miss out on, and and it's 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 something that we have tried to a few times to work out how to get data across. So we work really quite hard to try and get um, smart cane data, and just don't get very much of it at all. Um, a couple of regions have done really well to get that data, but. Yeah, like we we know that there's lots of stuff happening out there, but we really need the data to be able to tell the story. Like our job is to tell the story of what's happening. Um, without the data, we, we just making stuff up. And one of the big pushes that we've been on lately is that in <coughs> order for uh, smart cane BNP data to be included in Adam's assessment, uh, the growers have to opt in to reporting to Paddington Reef, it's one of the questions when you're first doing your accreditation. So the more people that we have <coughs> opt in to reporting what they're doing back to Paddington Reef, then the more of that we're going to be able to capture. So that's something they're really keen to see is an increase in the amount of people opting in to reporting their data. That way we can tell more of that story. Thank you. Anyone else? I feel like it's time to wrap up. Everyone's ready to stand up, stretch, get on with their afternoon. So look, thank you everyone so much for your time and your attention. We really do appreciate your time and coming. Thank you to the speakers um, for their efforts and thank you very much to the, the Reef Catchments team for, for putting this together. So uh, take care everyone and safe travels home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, someone else with Peter. Yeah, I'd just like to thank Renee for all of her efforts leading up to today and also for facilitating this forum. So if you could put your hands together. We will get the, the slides out to you as well and um, a copy of uh, this feedback and any questions that weren't answered today, we'll get that around to you by email as well. Thanks everyone.